This episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast is brought to you by On Point Pomade. Keep your beard and hair looking on point with their line of pomades and beard oils over at onpointpomade.com. Use our code BSP15 at checkout and get 15% off your total purchase order. So thanks again to On Point Pomade for sponsoring our show. This episode is also sponsored by the Bean Bastard Coffee. Head over to thebeanbastard.com and pick up any one of their delicious hand-roasted coffees. Coffee lovers will also enjoy their hand-cut and handmade espresso candles and soaps as well. If you're in the Buffalo, New York area, head to their store located at 448 Elmwood Avenue. And thanks again to the Bean Bastard for supporting this show. The Speaking Podcast is proudly sponsored by Rockabilia.com. With over 500,000 officially licensed items in their online store, you're guaranteed to find something you need. Use our code BRUTALLY and get 10% off your total purchase order. Now on to the show. People say you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing. This rings true because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard. And you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, and if you're not having fun doing it, you're going to give up. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast. I am your host, John. And this episode's guest is Jason Boyd, singer for Audio Vents. This episode <laughs> this episode has been in the works for a good three years at least um i had reached out to jason a long time ago uh before even the audio event reunion uh, was announced and jason was interested in coming on and uh we just kept going back and forth and back and forth and uh as you'll kind of hear um jason's just not it's not that he's not good at communicating. It's more that he just doesn't doesn't use social media, doesn't really uh, doesn't live like kind of in the world that we we do. And I think you know it's great uh, unless you're trying to get a hold of him. Uh, I think it's great to kind of exist in the real world, not in the digital sense, uh, like so many of us do. And I feel like it's just got to be so freeing, actually, to to be able to live that life. Um, but it was one of those things that when we had initially started, you know, it was like a lot of the conversations, uh, that I set up on my own that aren't through a publicist and it's just me, you know, hitting someone up randomly, uh, where it's a, Hey, you know, it'd be really great if we could talk, uh, when this is announced, because then we can talk about this thing or, Hey, if we could do it after, uh, this thing. Um, so there's a lot of times where I have to wait, uh, and be patient, which is, Something I am good at, but I also fucking hate. Uh, I hate being patient. And uh, this was one of those where I just kind of had figured it wasn't going to happen. Uh, I hadn't heard from Jason in, in a while, about a year and a half. And I was just like, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm done. I guess it's just not going to happen. Uh, you know, and just, it's fine. Uh, there are a lot of conversations that look like they're going to happen. And I've literally been sitting right here uh, getting ready to do them. And then I get an email or a text or something from someone. And it's like, yeah, man, sorry, not happening. And then they just don't happen. Um, it is the life of doing podcasts. Um, but it is one of those where... I had been looking in my emails and cleaning up a lot of my podcast emails and was just like, oh, yeah, I should reach out to Jason one more time. And then, boom, out of nowhere, later that night, uh, he actually had sent me a Facebook message and was like, hey, man, still interested in doing this podcast if you're still interested. And uh, here's my phone number. Do that. It's a lot faster to, to text me than it is to hit me up on any of these things. And uh, it was it finally happened. But I do think this is a great example of – Things happening when they're supposed to happen, not when you want them to happen. And I am so thankful that this happened when it did because I learned so much about Jason and, and I feel like we really connected on a lot of interesting talking points that I don't think I would have had uh, and I would have asked uh, three years ago when I initially reached out. It probably would have been very much very audio event focused um, instead of kind of learning 
more about Jason as a person uh, and his life through the prism of at times of, of being a musician and, and being, you know, the singer of audio event. And to me, I think this is a much better conversation as a result of, of having to wait. But I don't want to make you wait any longer to hear this. So without further ado, this is my conversation with Jason Boyd. I'll talk to you all on the other side of it. First time we've been kind of talking in Burberry. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a very isolated person most of the time. I kind of keep my I kind of keep to myself and I make shit. So, well, I feel like I mean, and we're already going because it just okay, goes. Cool. We don't like I said, it's not an interview. It's just a conversation, right. so it makes it even easier. But I mean, like I feel like that's that's even interesting to me. Like I. I feel like you have to be i think you're probably at least a good eight years older than me i'm gonna be 38 this year so i feel like you're probably in your early 40s ish i'm 42 actually so okay. i'm four years older than you. okay yeah okay so but i feel like you're you and i collectively are on the cusp like i kind of get to hating social media now where i'm like i really okay. would love to like not have it uh yeah. i find that my interactions with it are, are a lot fewer and farther between and if i didn't have this where i had to kind of post i wouldn't um and yeah. it gets to the point where like i even like i was looking at podcast stats uh earlier today and just kind of looking at stuff and you know there's stuff i used to do where i would like pull little snippets from this uh and like throw it during the middle of the week and be like hey here's something if you haven't yeah. checked out the new episode and it like got no interaction and i'm just like why the fuck do i do that like it what's the point of spending more time doing something that doesn't quote unquote get actual engagement when i could be utilizing that time and having actual engagement with people in real life yeah i mean it's that's totally true and i i, I ran into some of the same issues because uh, uh when you do anything you do that you care about and then you want to share it with the world in a quick way the way we have you know the access to it now with social media if it, it uh, our our um uh and this is for most i feel like most people in general you the thing you're putting up that you're so in that moment like ah oh, like i made this or i took this picture or whatever you know if it doesn't get the gratification that you're expecting in your head or that you already have for it in your head all of a sudden you feel terrible about yourself and feel terrible about even trying to put it out into the world um yeah that's been that's been actually part of my problem for for years now is uh, learning the uh, the changing uh, landscape of how to put things out and whatnot. I'm I'm always gonna make stuff. I'm always gonna like. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm making music right now. I'm making making a record for myself, and then we're gonna be uh, speaking of. Well, we didn't speak about it yet, but audio events getting together with Ben. Hopefully, this next week uh, to yeah, <laughs> you got it right there. <laughs> um, to work on the the uh, the actual second record that we never put out, so we've got a bunch of songs, and both he and I have been writing separately. So, gonna have more of that. It's it's funny to me because like when you messaged me and I said it was serendipitous timing of like I was right. kind of cleaning out my inbox, just kind of going like, all right, like that one seems like it's not gonna happen, you know, whatever. And for some reason, I think it was because like. I lost the email initially and then I was like, fuck, like you're not active on anything. So it's not yeah. like I can just be like, Hey, quick DM, like, Hey, da, 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 are we still good or whatever? And we'll have that constant communication. Yeah. So finding that email again, I was like, I should reach out. And I was like, cause you know, before it was, uh, yeah, let's do something soon. We're kind of working on some audio event news. So it'll yeah. kind of be perfect timing. And then it was, well, let's wait for the shows to get announced. Let's wait for this. And then the shows kind of came and went. And then it yeah. was, uh, I was like, all right, I guess like the moment kind of came and went. So like, you're probably like, I don't want to fucking talk about, you know, something that happened 20 some odd years ago or for it to be the crux of a conversation. But it, it kind of seemed like those shows went well. And I know at the time I was pleasantly surprised to hear that you guys were redoing, you know, reunion shows or whatever. Yeah. And I mean, it was, it's funny how it came about too, because we were almost going to, um, uh, the reason we even started talking about playing playing together again was because uh, uh, Stank was doing a a, a tour, and they wanted us to join them. And so we're just like, oh, that might be kind of fun and random, and just like you know, because we're friends with those guys. Uh, and um, 
it didn't end up happening, obviously. I think they had to cancel their shows and everything, but it spurred it spurred us to be like, why don't we just play our own shows? We could probably, you know, bring enough people in to make it fun and, you know, worth it and make some t shirts and, you know, do the whole thing just for a short, short little thing just to see what happens. And it was great. Um excuse me, I wish we could have built on the uh momentum of that, but um then COVID well, I think, happened. And- <laughs> I was like, I think everyone's <laughs> momentum got killed. <laughs> everyone's momentum got killed. Yeah, exactly. How were those shows? I mean, I know it, it's always one of those things I get so mad living here in the Midwest and, you know, flights not being insanely cheap, but it's like right. one of those where it seems like the West Coast always gets the best reunion shows where you're like, ah, <laughs> fuck, man. Like, granted, I have since been to the West Coast and I've been to some of those rooms and, you know, paying $20 to see some small ass band mm-hmm. I've never heard of at the Viper Room seemed a bit much, but, yeah. uh, you know, those are kind of the situations where, I feel like if you lived out there it would be fun because then when you have some of these one-off uh, reunion shows, it'd be like, oh, fuck it. I'll go. Yeah. And thankfully a lot of people did say, fuck it. I'll go. Cause that sounds <laughs> interesting, man. <laughs> I haven't heard this band in forever. I wonder what the hell they're doing. I, they probably got gained a little weight and uh, you know, they probably look like adults now, <laughs> but we were still thrashing. We still had a great time. Um, it, the, the shows were awesome. Uh, they were, uh, it was really, really fun to, um, to just get back to, uh, I mean, I hadn't played with Ben in forever. Besides, like, uh, you know, a lot of my adult uh, jobby job stuff has been um, commercial singing, singing in the commercial world and doing that. And before the pandemic, I was kind of making a killing on that. It was great. But, um, and Ben does that actually. Mm. So he and I would get, he and I work together a lot on that kind of stuff too. Um, but getting to play together in this capacity, and then um, bringing Paul back in, and I hadn't seen Paul for years. I mean, Paul's married, has twins, lives in you know Arizona. Like he's he's uh, he's he's good, but he uh, it's just so nice to gather him back together again and get some of those same vibes back. Uh, we didn't have Jamin. Jamin's kind of uh, uh, well, he's in a different place in his life. He's also doing the commercial writing stuff, but um, I don't I don't know that he plays drums as much anymore. Mm-hmm. So we got uh, a guy. Uh, a guy named Shane, who's just awesome. And he's a good friend of Ben's. He's in the production world. So we kind of Ben knew him through there. And uh, and he was a big audio fan, which was fun because he knew he knew all the songs already. So uh, yeah, it was a it was a really good time, really great turnouts. Um, I want to do more of them. It is weird playing old songs. I know that because I wrote those. I mean, I, I, we, we wrote those songs together and I wrote those lyrics when I was 20 and 21. I'm 42 now, so I don't resonate with those lyrics at all anymore. But I mean, that's that's what happens when you make a piece of art that you keep having to show. You know, I mean, shit, we were getting tired of the stuff when we were on tour, but you just have to find new ways to make it fun. Always. Well, I mean, that kind of brings forth a few different questions, actually, and one of which I guess I'll start with since you, we just ended with that. Um, you know, kind of going back to something you wrote half your life ago. Mm-hmm what do some of the songs mean to you now? Cause I'm sure you have to kind of maybe not put yourself back into those same situations, but maybe think about how those lyrics now apply to your life now as a 42 year old versus a 21, 22 year old. How was that process for you? Um, it was, it was weird because I definitely did have to find uh, that, that place without attaching the, uh, the sort of uh, nostalgic tie to it from back in the day. You know what I mean? Um, so it, it was, uh, it was fun because having your friends around while you're doing it, they're going through the same process, uh, with the stuff they wrote, you know, on their instruments. And, um, uh, there's a, there was a little bit of updating that went, went on. We, we made, uh, I kind of morphed the melodies a little bit to a place. I mean, I can't, I, when I wrote that record, when we wrote that record and then we went on tour, I mean, I was like screaming basically at the top of my lungs (laughs) and destroying my voice. And then we'd have to go the next morning at like, early, early mornings and do radio shows and like, uh, that whole world. So it was, it was never ideal how we were doing it in the first place and how we wrote the record. Uh, so I, I tweaked some of the melodies to make it so that, uh, they were still the same melody basically, but I could, um, have a little more fun with it because I've, I don't know, I, I've, uh, I feel like I've learned a lot more about my own voice and about singing in general, just through life and, um, the types of music that I've gotten into since audio events. And, uh, so 
uh, finding that place in the older songs and then also finding the tie to the newer stuff I've been writing. It still sounds like audio event, but I, but it definitely is definitely a more mature version. And, uh, I think we're having a little more fun. I don't know. I know. I, I know I am. I mean, I was having a lot of fun with the melodies. We, we re-recorded, uh, a handful of them and it was, it was really fun to like reimagine them, but still keep the same sort of like initial spark that's there. So we did we did that and it went over really really well. I think that's kind of like the the interesting thing as, and I feel like a unique position you're in where you know, unfortunately you have the one record that's out, but you know like I, I kind of am intrigued to hear whatever this new thing is because I'm wondering if it's ideas that you started and never finished from back then that would have been the proper follow up or. Right. Is it something where you're completely writing 100% new, and I'm sure you are, uh, writing 100% new things and maybe conjunction with old ideas and, and kind of having to find, again, find your way and I guess either rediscovering who you were yeah, versus who you are now yeah, and, and marrying the two, which I think is really interesting because it sort of touches on something I've talked about quite a bit, which is this duality of, you know, artists live in the moment they're constantly creating mm -hmm. but unfortunately given the the nature of the music industry we won't hear it for eight months to a year maybe two years later yeah. so what is new to us is really old for you you've already exercised <laughs> and worked your way through it and yeah. we're now and now that you're kind of excited about the things you're creating which we won't hear for another two years but to have hopefully, such a gap yeah. good oh, i'm sorry ho hopefully that won't be the case i'm what i'm trying to do with this year in general and you know, audio event stuff aside, because that'll happen when Ben and I actually get together and do it. But um, I'm trying to get over, and I'm just going to be completely honest. I've 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 struggled with uh, with self esteem issues and all kinds of things when it comes to the things that I create, because I create them first and foremost uh, for me uh, directly. It's just something that kind of gushes out of me every single time, and I have to do it. Um, it keeps me sane. It keeps me you know keeps me happy just in myself. So, uh, uh, but what I'm looking forward to doing, cause I have hundreds of songs and hundreds of, I mean, so, so much music, uh, that's not, not even all like songs, some of it's orchestral, some of it's like soundtrack things that need to be used. Uh, but, um, I'm hoping this year to be more of a, I finished this, I'm just going to fucking let it go. Just let it go. Yeah. Put it out. Put it out and let it go, um, because the expectation of perfection now with the, with where the music industry is and where I don't know. Um, I would rather reintroduce something. This is just my own personal like hope for the for the future. We can get back to a place where uh, you're seeing real raw art again, not uh, things that are so perfected. Um, you know, auto tunes kind of become like a main it's a mainstay thing. Pop and hip hop and country have kind of taken over yeah and that's all perfect it's all perfected it's all perfectly produced and perfectly placed and everything this 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 um i look forward to um i don't know i you know i grew up on on messy awesome shit that was like <laughs> not trying to hide its its uh its faults you know because they were it was real you know yeah. So I kind of, there's a punk rock aspect aspect to that. And I, I want to get back to that place. Um, and uh, yeah, I forget what the initial question is, but I went off on a tangent there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. That's, that's actually what the medium is, is great for. Um, yeah. You know, something, you know, you talked about how you and Ben and, and seemingly everyone in the band are all now uh, writing. I don't want to say necessarily studio musicians, but writing jingles, writing things uh, mm -hmm. where, where music is still, uh, your job, but you in the truest of senses now are totally writing from the perspective of selling something. How has that been? Because I feel like yeah. it's an awesome tool that you're just getting to create and create all kinds of different things. It doesn't matter because you're just trying to match what, you know, needs to be to sell the, the thing, whatever it exactly, happens to be. Yeah. So you, in that capacity, I feel like you're actually probably more versed in a lot of different styles and genres and production techniques and so forth, because you have to be. Absolutely. Yeah. But has, it, yeah. has it maybe kind of uh, devalued? I, I don't want to say it like that's the only word that keeps coming to mind. Yeah. Kind of devalued it because you're looking at it and what you're creating is essentially for 
commodifying something. Yeah, I mean, not not necessarily. I mean, I haven't felt that way. Uh, um, I haven't felt that way. There, there's there's been um, it's been fun because you get to actually use what you what you know how to do. And uh, uh, I mean, I've my voice has been on various national spots doing like. You know, I think the, the last major one that I did was a uh, um, was a GMC ad that ran for like a year and a half. Like it was on nonstop, and it's funny because it comes on, and every time it comes on, you know you're getting paid. So it's like <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay, there's nothing wrong with this because this is making it so I can make my own art uh, like all the time, um, uh, not put it out, <laughs> but still make it. <laughs> um ga- gather the the arsenal for when the the battle begins if you know what i mean so uh yeah. um in that sense no i i haven't felt that yet and it's and, and i i kind of like to be stretched in that way um i don't know how ben feels about it uh he's he's done significantly more of it than i have he has his own company now where he's where he's doing that uh and uh so i don't know how he feels about it but no it it hasn't bothered me in that way and it's honestly it's made my my own art uh it's made me appreciate it even more i think uh mm. to tell you the truth and um i don't know it's only added to the i i love uh the cinematic aspect of music pairing it with picture in general mm-hmm. so uh and i want to do more of that i would love i i want to i've gotten the opportunity to do little things but i would love to score films i would love to score tv shows and do all that kind of stuff because it's i when i write music i see picture mm. i see things going on so uh yeah I I I, lo- I love doing it. I would love to do more of it, to tell you the truth. But also release records and do things that are just purely from the gut, the soul. You know what I mean? It's funny you mentioned the like kind of seeing pictures when you're you're writing it and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Andrew, that's in this band, The Ghost Inside, he oh, really? released a new solo record uh, like a couple weeks ago uh, with his project One Decade, and it's called Chromesthesia. And okay. basically, it is the like when he writes, he thinks of colors. He see like, you know, we've talked mm. about that. And it was yeah. one of those where he released it and each song is a color. And it's oh, cool. when we're gonna have a discussion soon about kind of breaking down more of just like, okay, why did like what about this makes you think of cyan, makes you think of rust, makes you think of you know the the names you gave each uh track. Yeah. Um but it, it's one of those where sometimes like one of the few other people I think that kind of has it, even though I think it literally drives him crazy, is Kanye. Like, you know, you he talks oh, yeah. about how he, like, sees music and can, like, smell yeah. music and all this kind of stuff, and it yeah. makes him feel this way. Unfortunately, I think he is very smart and gifted in that capacity, but I think it stunted him in almost every other capacity of oh, being sure a fuck, person. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, yeah, that's 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 also the that's the rub of of uh, uh, there's a blessing and a curse to when, when you when your when your body and your brain just sort of pushes this stuff out of you and uh, and you know whether you're you're seeing color or you're seeing picture whatever while you're doing this it's if you don't have exactly the right avenue for it, it can definitely mess you up. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, Kanye's doing all right. He's, <laughs> I don't know how he is personally. I don't but know. <laughs> he seems like he's doing all right. He's a, uh, you know, he's Kanye. Yeah. <laughs> yes, very much. Um, where has been one of the most random sources of inspiration for you? Uh, where either you thought of something musically because of what you were viewing or something you were making <laughs> musically. Okay thought uh of an, an image that would go great with it um let me see uh i mean this happens every time i when i'm watching a movie that i love what's going on with the with the uh the cinematography uh i mean i've done this where i'll turn the volume i'll, I'll mute it and i'll just like hear other other another soundtrack to it basically just what's going on in my head and um uh <laughs> i was gonna be completely honest with you it's it, it's funny i've i've uh uh um, I've watched porn before in my life, you know, at least oh, only once though. Only once. only once. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny. I, I, I have noticed that sometimes if, if, if there's, I don't know if I'm watching porn or someone's watching porn or something, for some reason I get weird ideas. So that's a very strange place source of unintentional <laughs> inspiration. If I see people having sex, I'm going to start writing something. <laughs> as long as I guess it isn't you, where you're like, exactly, hold, on, babe, yeah. hold on, hold on, I uh, got to go grab this. I have a melody in my head all of a sudden. Yeah, Sorry. Exactly. 
we'll get that back or, to it. That or maybe I should start scoring points. Maybe that's what it is. That's, uh, I mean, after watching, uh, I just started watching the Pam and Tommy thing. Oh, how is it? Uh, I think it's amusing, but I think there's, I don't know if people were expecting it to be more serious. Oh, because it's kind of like they're having fun with it. Oh yeah, like yeah. Tommy Lee's dick is voiced by Jason Manzukis, and they're having no, a conversation. They they do that. Oh, oh yeah, God. and then they show it, and it's like moving, and it's like wiggling up to talk to him. Do they show the mouth talking on the penis. It's, it's a fake dick, so it clearly is just like a hole that like is not your but urethra. Still, they, they they do the thing where they're making the mouth the penis. No, talk. they don't do that. But okay, like it's, that's, it that's moves. been in my head for a while. Like there yeah. should be some weird random like adult no. Where there's a dick that just talks. <laughs> I mean, your your one of your last posts on Instagram would definitely lead me to think that uh you're heavily influenced in kind of that uh William Street adult swim kind of style. I, I love Robot I love Chicken, that. especially. Yeah, I, I would uh I would love to to collaborate with, with uh those those people. Um I I, I love uh, making stop motion things and just um, that that last thing that I posted and I I do this all the time my my uh, phone is filled my voice notes are filled with tons of these but just I'll just have a random thought where like there's a little conversation that happens or a character needs to get something out um, this happens the same way that music happens for me it just springs up and then it's very clear exactly what it is and if I don't get it out it kind of plagues me. And then, uh, so I have to get it out in some way. So with characters, I'll oftentimes just record something into my phone. And then that last one, that was a recording I did into my phone. And I just animated something to it and made it, made it seem like it was a self-contained thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's stuff I have to, I definitely have to do. Uh, what? Oh, but the Pam, the Pam and Tommy thing, funny yeah. little side note, I uh, uh, auditioned for a part in that. Okay. Because um, I've also been doing acting over the years as well. Um, the I auditioned for I, I haven't seen it yet and I don't know if it's up yet but it was for the uh, bass player of Third Eye Blind. I don't no, even that, know what that he looks well like. as of right now that has not happened. The only that band that well, exists in the happen. show currently is what I assume to be Methods of Mayhem. Uh, okay, because that's oh. around that's around when that happened. So I I I think I may have even tried out for that band too. Actually, after I left Audio Event, I kind of like I went to film school. And then uh, uh, got, I mean, I had so many random offers. People were calling me like bands that I grew up listening to and like heavy, really heavy metal bands. Their managers calling me and saying like, hey, you know, we heard your, you know, you left uh, audio events and, um, uh, you know, the guys were talking and they would, they wanted me to reach out to you. would love for you to come and join their group or be their new singer or there's this super group that's forming or um i mean i tried out but i i was talking to the, some of the guys from uh a number of velvet revolver slash yes. band. yeah yeah they they potentially want to be interesting for them uh after i think after scott died or something like that uh or after he left i don't know what it yeah was. there's i mean little actually both um yeah because i mean the the stories now it, it's so crazy the stories that like kind of come out after like well after the fact especially now that gnr is mostly back together are they really mostly back together? Oh wow! Uh, Slash and Duff rejoined the band. Okay. Uh, it's still most of the the people you would have remembered from um, Axel's version of the band. Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically, I mean, Izzy's not in it, as far as I know. Um, Matt Swarm's not in it. Uh, God, what the fuck's his name? The original drummer, um, Stephen Adler's. Oh, Stephen Adler. He, yeah. he comes in sporadically and will play like one or two songs. Okay. Um, but it's one of those where, you know, and all these years later, you know, Corey Taylor was like, oh, at one point I was tapped to like do Velvet Revolver. <laughs> and then you hear like Josh Todd from Buck Cherry. But then they were like, oh, it's too, too similar to Buck Cherry. And, and, you know, everyone will make the parallel like, oh, obviously, like, because he sounds kind of like Axel. This is why you picked him. And, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. So I know that they were looking in all these interviews I've heard since then when people that have tried out or were tapped yeah. to potentially do it, that it's like, you know, they wanted someone that can still do the GNR stuff. It sounded like still do some covers. Um, yeah. And then once Scott was in, then it was like, all right, he kind of can do some other stuff because we can play STP. I mean, yeah. it's almost like the traditional super group route where it's like, okay, we, we we're a new band, but we're also going to kind of play around with some of our older material too. Yeah. in the band, you yeah. know, 
because I guess that's how you get ass in the seats. Because well, yeah, and that's that's the thing. Yeah, people people that are coming there are going to be so stoked if they see like they're coming to watch the super group where they know some of the songs, but then oh my god, they played their some of their old songs from the other band. They get so so excited. People get so excited about that shit. Um, I yeah. I feel like sometimes that's a discredit. Like I mean, it would be one of those things to me where I'd be like, all right, so if you ended up getting in Velvet Revolver, it's like all right, like. You gonna play, play like you're gonna play like a couple audio bin songs like are, are <laughs> that you? would be funny uh, <laughs> that would be really funny um I, I i would love to see a look on ben's face if i was in double revolver when we start playing songs. <laughs> uh here's oh, a yeah. three minute long solo ben sorry you yeah. didn't want to record this but yeah. uh, Sla- uh sla- also slash learned your part ben what do you think about that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's yeah. wild to like wh- i mean shit at this point like what are I mean, you said Methods of Mayhem and Velvet Revolver. I mean, what else? Because, like, that's that's the side of things, like, I, I think is so interesting that, like, like I said, we don't hear these stories until well after the fact or, yeah. unfortunately, uh, in a, a kind of self-grandizing way of being like, well, I was tapped to do this and this and this. Yeah. But to me, I think just kind of showcases almost kind of like Hollywood to a degree where people sort of run out of ideas and instead of creating something for themselves and something new, they kind of look around at what already is successful and go, well, what can we pull from that and make? Yeah, so we so can to, stay up here on this level. and Yeah, exactly. And so it's, to me, that that's interesting to, to kind of to hear that even, you know, a band like Audio Event, to, which to me was a big band, but I understand now as I've gotten older that it's like, there are a lot of bands I thought were huge, and I've come to learn we're definitely not. Well, I'm, uh, glad we're, I'm glad we were big in your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry that didn't pay for, you know, the, the expensive cars and all that with my one that's purchase of your CD. <laughs> that's that's totally fine. Uh, uh, maybe the next one will. <laughs> I'll buy two. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> Actually, I was just reading about how a band is uh, to get around Spotify's horrible pay rate. Oh, uh, okay. They are releasing a thousand song album and each song is about 30 seconds long because the new pay rate you have to play a song for 30 seconds. So they're basically, it's a demonstration of how shitty the pay rate is and that it doesn't matter the music because who's going to listen to 30 seconds of something and have that be of any value as an artist. Yeah. So it's basically speaking to the fact that Spotify pays so shittily and that every that this is all a fucking joke. Yeah. So they're releasing a thousand song album. That's only 30 second songs. Wow. Well, I mean, not to brag, but I've got some really good thirty-second little pieces. So. Yeah. Put, <laughs> them on, put them on. Put them on Spotify. <laughs> no, that's did you're giving me the idea? Like, why not just say fuck it and just just put put everything up there in one chunk and then just be like, all right, get this, listen to it. Uh, thirty sec. Wow, so thirty seconds. The new cut. The new uh, like has to be just thirty seconds at yep. least. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, the Spotify well, page well, as a as a uh, play technically to them. Wow. Which, I, yeah, like yeah. I said, looking at my own stats, I thought it was weird because it's like you have starts, listens, and then something else. And you just see these numbers that like don't correlate at all. And you're like, well, how do you how do you look at that as as to like cognitive data to then try to be like, OK, so this is what it's telling me. And it's yeah. like that tells me nothing. <laughs> so what's good nothing is information? Yeah. And and no matter what, I'm screwed. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, they're, they're, some of the other services I mean I was looking are a little bit better, but uh, um, man, it's just it just reminds me of of when I was in middle school and high school. You know, the the band Audio Event was my was my life, uh, and we were um, all we wanted was to be on a label. That was the dream. It was just you get on a label. Uh, there was always like what I call the pretty woman phase in the beginning where they send you limos, they take you to lunch and a dinner and like strip clubs and they're doing all the things, you know, and, uh, um, then they hand you the bill. Then they hand you the bill. Exactly. <laughs> I, I remember distinctly being when we were, we were on Atlantic and it was toward the end of our run when we were making, uh, our second, we were making the second record. Did you ever hear any of the, the demos that we put out? I probably have, but I'm old yeah. and my brain's kind of shot. <laughs> we, we put out, um, I think we just, yeah, we just put it on YouTube. I made like a graphic for them and then we just put up uh, a bunch of the songs on YouTube like years ago. But um, I remember going into Atlantic and them telling us like, uh, okay, so at this point you guys, you know, you guys owe us like over a million dollars. It's like, we owe you this money? So it was our first lesson in, um, oh no, you don't actually owe this company anything, uh, but 
they're going to make you feel bad about it. And um, everything you've spent up in this point was not, it was not like, it's not like the record company was spending it on you. <laughs> it, was, it was going into your uh, account that you have mm -hmm. to then try and pay back, but whatever. It, 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 that time period, we, I feel like we kind of rode the, uh, the industry down um, as, it was, as it was crashing at the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we, we had fun. We made, a, you know, we made like two albums worth of music in a, in a house that Atlantic rented, rented for us um, and uh, went through a lot of changes, uh, changed drummers. Jamin, Jamin left the band. And uh, uh, yeah, it was an interesting time. This is maybe a weird question you've never been asked, mm. and, and you don't have to answer it if it's too weird. You know, I, I think about things now as, as I'm getting older, and like I don't have kids, but like a lot of my friends do, mm -hmm. and it's been interesting to like kind of talk to my friends who have kids and thinking about my parents from a different perspective now that I'm you know older as well. Right. What is it like having being in a family where you have two signed bands where because I feel like parents are always trepidatious about, you know, they want the best. They want you to chase your dreams. Yeah. But there also is that side where it's like, well, I don't want you to get your heart broken. I don't you know, I'm worried about you and all that kind of stuff. Does having another sibling that's in a band that's also kind of making it, does mm -hmm. it make it easier for both like the family, the rest of the family to kind of go like you're not a fucking idiot for pursuing this. Like, I guess it's working yeah. here. Yeah. So like, I guess go ahead. Um, and... I mean, yeah, that, that was my, um, uh, are, are you done? Sorry. I didn't want to mean to no, 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 you're good. Okay. Um, I mean, I can tell you just from, uh, having the perspective of, of, you know, age and time and whatnot. Um, Brandon having a band, I mean, I, I started playing drums when I was 12 and I incubus started when I was, 13 because they played their first show was my 13th birthday party <laughs> so uh, nice of you yeah did you I have the, I, uh, no but uh, <laughs> I, I i have the i have the, the tape somewhere of uh of that birthday party and then the next birthday party which was one of our first shows when we were called tempest okay uh and we were just like a metal band and i was doing like spoken word poetry like dark death metal poetry over over like like oh my, so you're almost and Metallica type yeah um and uh uh but yeah so he so him doing what he what he did at an early age showed you that oh wait there's a way to do this and i i I'd idolized these all these bands growing up and stuff and I, and I had an example right in front of me and oh wow you, this is the way to do this so naturally i was my, you know uh and ben's brother also both ben's brothers paul and ben mm -hmm. or sorry both mike's brothers paul and ben um felt the same way. They're like, wow, this actually looks like it'd be really fun. Let's do this too. Uh, our parents were always supportive. They've always been supportive of everything we've wanted to do. Um, thankfully, uh, they're very, uh, my dad is a businessman definitely, but he, he's an, I think he's an artist in the back of his brain. My mom's an artist. Um, they didn't get to live out their dreams in certain ways. They're very happy people, but they didn't get to do certain things they wanted to do growing up. One, um, for them, it was acting and singing mm. on stage. They they met in a in a stage production, um, and uh, and then oddly enough, when we both formed our bands, my parents were going through a very lengthy divorce. Mm. So you know what happens in divorce, right? Uh, neither of the parents wants the kid to be upset with them. So they just kind of let them do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> so we were, we were graced with the opportunity to be able to have these like massive parties at our house, at our house where mm. my parents just disappeared. The entire school would come essentially. There would be mosh pits in the, our tiny, in our like tiny little backyard with like a brick wall right next to them. And like, there could have been lawsuits and shit, but um, it was, thankfully it was, it was fine. It was safe. And they were, legendary parties i mean they, you know these were uh some of Incubus's first shows some of our first shows uh and um uh, yeah at some point i'll put the i'll put these videos up when i i need to transfer them but uh but they're pretty they're pretty epic um all the mosh pits especially of like little, little high school kids <laughs> and stuff i just the more i kind of think about things like that because something i've kind of been fascinated with in just thinking about it from a, a mental health perspective and just kind of yeah. what does it do to you as people, you know, a lot of 
people I befriended, in, you know, in bands and so forth, you know, a lot of them are signed really young, mm -hmm. uh, possibly so they can take advantage of your naivety and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, a lot of times I think about, you know, what does it do to you when you start doing something? Cause it's fun. It looks like fun and I'm hanging with my friends and we're, we're creating music mm -hmm. and it's, it's so simple. That's all that matters. That's all that you care about. And then starts coming some, some fame and some notoriety on a local scene, whatever. And then maybe a, a label comes and courts you. And then it turns into, Oh, we think you're great. And you know, all this kind of stuff. But then, you know, you go tour and I think touring and I think traveling is something that, you know, as I've been doing it with my wife in the last, you know, mm -hmm. 10 years, it's opened me up to learn more about me, more about the world around me. And I think that's invaluable, but I also think about a lot of the pressures and the things that these labels and so forth are putting mm -hmm. children who don't even yeah. aren't fully formed in their own capacities, who they are putting them in these weird situations that are not normal, kind of having to find yourself in that unnatural yeah. state. And then when you are no longer like, you know, handing in an album and you're like, man, I'm really fucking proud of this. And they're like, no, nah, I don't hear the single go back yeah. or this sucks. And it's like, well, shit, I thought you liked me uh, yeah. or I thought you liked what we did. Like, and then you kind of go home and no one is you're not normal there because that's not your normal life either. Yeah. So you're just kind of left in this weird in between. And just what does that do to a person it's so young? And yeah. that's kind of where a lot of like some of that question of like, you know, what is it like having, you know, having another sibling that was in a band kind of at the same time yeah. having some success, does that make it easier for you and your parents to kind of go like, okay, go ahead and go on this tour. It, it seems like things are fine and you're well yeah. adjusted enough to do it. Yeah, no, they, they, uh, uh, uh that did make all that easier. Absolutely. As far as like, uh, um, yeah, my parents trusting that we were going to be okay and everything like that. And like, it was, uh, they, they also, I mean, they saw him how like kind of immediately successful, uh, you know, obviously their success grew, 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 but like Incubus kind of got him with attention right away. And uh, we did in our own way too, but we were always seen as the little brothers. You know, we were called baby Incubus forever. Like we go out on the road and that was kind of the bane of our existence for a little while. Like we do, I look back at interviews, I feel bad because like I look back at interviews and I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because I was tired of like, you know, interviewers always going like, uh, so you get tired of people calling you baby incubus and like, you know, uh, uh, what do you think about your brother, this and that, and that, you know, so I, I would get, I would get tired of it. But, um, in that situation I needed, uh, I needed to just know my brother better anyways. Hmm. Cause, uh, I mean, just throughout the years now, throughout the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years or so, especially the last few years, we've gotten really close and, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, I'm grateful for his experience uh, for not only him, but for me too. It's, it's been fun to watch and, uh, and seeing an example of something that can actually like really work. It's cool. It's interesting to me and kind of what you said sort of led to another question I've always wondered, but it's yeah. really a shitty way to, it's not my business, but first and foremost, I'm going to say this, like there was a, a person that used to work for Roadrunner back in the day that was on this show uh tom hazart don't know if you remember him at all i, I do i think i even listened to the show actually that was and maybe yeah he had mentioned on my show that it's funny that you that a lot of people and i do remember seeing that in press too like oh it's i mean and it's hard not to make the correlation with you know both you and ben yeah. uh, obviously being brothers of uh, people in another band but yeah. beyond that it was tom had made the comment he goes it's funny you know everyone kind of says that audio event is the baby version of this and he goes but really I feel like Incubus was always the baby version of what they were and kind of even took a little bit of their sound and ran with it and got bigger faster. And then because of that, that's why the perception isn't exactly how it should have been. Right. And I've never heard anyone say that, but it was interesting to have him say that again, it's all well after the fact. So who knows if that's how anyone at the label felt or anything like that, but right. it was always interesting. And then that kind of made me start thinking, it, and, you know, we see it with social media now, but like just how there was probably this constant pitting of you two against each other, because that's what you yeah. do. You can't be you can't. Well, there has to be some sort of a rivalry. You can't be happy for your brother's success. And, you know, maybe that's very Shakespearean of everybody to to assume that. But yeah. it's just one of those what things where I can't bad. can't uh, I can't imagine what that would have been like to, again, be so young and then constantly have people 
almost throw success in one fashion or another in yeah. your face. And it's like, yeah. why can't I be happy for my own success and also be happy for my fucking brother? Like, wouldn't yeah. that would, isn't that what a normal person would do? Well, people like, I mean, uh, um, we are, uh, we definitely are attracted to low hanging fruit. I think, uh, uh, in Absolutely. general, you know what I mean? If something is like, Ooh, that looks juicy. What is that? I wonder what that, you know, like whatever. Uh, thankfully Brandon is awesome. He's one of my favorite people in the world and he's so sweet and so generous and such. He's just such a good person. He's and as far as a celebrity goes too, he's like, he's probably the coolest celebrity you can imagine because he's not, he doesn't act I, like a It's weird. I don't even, he's been popping up on a couple of people's podcasts lately and I'm just like, yeah, you're exactly as I'd imagine you would be. Yeah. Like I just very, he's really smart, really yeah. thoughtful. Uh, he's, he's a, He's a goofball, which I love. He's he's uh, and especially that's one of one of the reasons why we've gotten so much closer too is because he's just he's allowed his his goofiness to come out, and I'm a I'm a goofball to heart, at heart, absolutely. Uh, so when now when we hang out, we just get to be like, and this is all I want from this is all I want with the rest of the world, anyways. But especially with my brothers, I just want to be kids with them. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want to be I want to have that sort of like let's play. I want to do that with everybody in the world. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. be able to just be on that on that level with everyone where it's just let's play let's collaborate let's laugh let's talk let's you know there doesn't need to be any 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 bullshit or any weird i don't know uh uh time is a is a beautiful thing when you allow it to do its job you know what i mean yeah it uh yeah it's really weird i <laughs> again coming back to like fortuitous and all that shit mm -hmm. i had i had that same kind of interaction like those last week or so just having a lot of those moments where i'm like oh i'm just glad to like have good friends and have like you yeah. know like i was telling you i got tattooed the other day and i didn't follow up with the message i was going to send you because i it wiped me out i was hoping um, you were send me a picture <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I am i will it's still okay, good. yes yeah, yeah. Picture, yeah. That's, a, that's, but, that's a good um, one i will be checking that that's great but it was uh, a thing where when we were done, like him and I talked for like two hours just about some family shit that both of us have been going through and, and getting older and, you know, being married and kind of, yeah. you know, not burying our wives or nothing, but like, just kind of like, <laughs> like, don't you find it funny? Oh yeah. You know, mine does how, that too. How long and been married for? I've been married going on six years, been with my wife, uh, 12. Nice, so, man. and been living together almost the entirety of that time. So yeah. it's, I, I, uh, I live with my girlfriend now, and I've, I've uh, I mean, I'm usually single. Uh, I, I keep myself alone on purpose so I could just create all the time. But um, she was a hard one to uh, to deny, and then all of a sudden we we moved in together very quickly too. Same. So it's, yeah, it's a. Uh... Yeah, it is. And, it, and usually I feel like if, if you can live together, if you can coexist together, and especially, you know, it's funny, like my wife and I, and so my friend and I, uh, Tetsu, our friend and I were talking because he's very much obviously a creative, has to, you know, draw and come up with things for people yeah. and um, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, you know, I feel kind of the same. Like I had a freak out moment and he posted about this. Uh, and so we talked about it a little bit further of just like trying to find balance in life as you get older because you're like, I want and do a lot of things, but I need time to be with my wife. I need time to myself and do the things I want to do. I need time to do this. Um, yeah. which takes a lot of time between setting everything up, actually doing it, you know, making the episodes and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I work like three part-time jobs because I want the ability to do what I want when I want. Mm -hmm. But at times I feel so overwhelmed and like I, I'm not succeeding or giving enough of myself in any of the things. Uh, so I'm at, it's actually a detriment yeah, uh, and I feel overwhelmed, and that has been something, you know. After going to therapy and stuff like that this past year, for me, it's really taught me to just be more present in the moment and enjoy the things that you do. Put all you can into it, and sometimes it's not always going to work out, or it's not going to be what you hoped it would be or wanted yeah. to be. But it's not going to be a forever thing. And if it starts feeling that way, then you have the ability to change and you make really change anything. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that was, you know, a lot of that's been coming full circle again in the last like week for me where I'm like, ah, I'm not spread too thin. My friends know that they mean something to me and that there's value mm -hmm. there. And that, uh, you know, we don't always have all the time to, to be with our friends or our, our family or whatever, but, um, we just need to make the most of the time we do have, yeah. but 
I also had made a comment to my wife because she was like, oh, I feel so old lately. And I go, I guess you're only as old as you feel. And perpetually in my head, I feel like I'm somewhere between 22 and 24 at all times. I, I, I feel like I'm a little kid, too. And the only thing that keeps me uh, remembering how old I am is the gray <laughs> will not go away in my beard. Uh, this is like the only place I get gray, right? Right here. Maybe a few little wisps in my hair, too. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I know what you mean. I'm, I'm glad you uh, you you found um, you found what you did in therapy, man. You know, I've, I've uh, uh, I'm back in therapy now, too. I mean, I've been in various therapy situations uh, throughout my life. And it's a very, very necessary thing. It's a very, very necessary thing to 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 get to get things out, you need to get out, you know, in a way that's like reflective so you can actually see what's going on in your own life. You know, it's, everything can bog you down. You know, life can become a, um, a soup that, uh, you know, you don't, you don't, and, and if you're in it, you don't know what the hell's in it. You gotta get out of it. You gotta be able to have some perspective. So yeah. it's good well, to taste your own soup sometimes. You know? <laughs> I, I think that's kind of like the thing as I've gotten older is, you know, just not being afraid to, I guess, A, put yourself out there first and foremost. Yeah. Like, you know, right before you and I started this, I was like, I want to start branching out. I want to start having different kinds of guests on. I don't want to just be solely focused on music, even though I feel like half the time now in the last year, the show isn't really music based. It's not like I'm interviewing you, like going like, all right, so let's run down track, you know, three, like tell me about yeah. how, like where that came from or tell me, you know, a story about recording the record. It's more about just getting to know the person and having like a human interaction. Um, and so, which I, and I, I, I like that, man. I like that route you chose because um, that's, uh, I feel like that's the connection people can always make with people they don't know when they see or listen to this or what whatnot. They can, um, I don't know, we're all going through something. We're all going through through our things in our own way. And it's, I think it's it is better to have straight conversations and kind of let it go where it, where it wants to. You know? Well, I feel like on top of that, it it's more like going back to what we were talking about in the beginning. I think the thing that drove me to this medium other than I just like to talk, but like is we're of the age where we didn't have social media. We didn't have yeah. those things. We were forced to actually talk to our friends yeah. uh, and, and, you know, learn about these people. I, it's interesting. I, I'm kind of intrigued as I get older to see what's the impact of the kids that have had social media all along, mm -hmm. what, what their friendships will look like, what their, excuse me, their long-term friendships will look like where, you know, I think some of my best friends, I still have, I have very few, but I have like three or four uh, from my high school time yeah. that I'm still super close with, but it's like, I've lived with them. I've known them forever. Like I know them inside and out because I've spent so much time with them, spent so much time talking with them. Yeah. I don't, I wonder if like people have that, will have that same connection because I feel like the hard part is, unless you're not active on social media, when you go to see your friends, they'll start being like, Oh, well I went and did, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I saw that. Or I mm -hmm. saw you post about that. And you kind of, <laughs> exactly. you kind of shut it down before they can even kind of tell like, you the story about it or actually yeah, yeah, yeah. something that's an actual per like, like not just something they're look, they're writing to try and catch people's eye for a second on the, on Instagram. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know what you mean. I, I, I have no idea where those, where those, kids are going to end up or where any of us are going to end up as far as social media goes. Um, I, I too only have um, uh, three or four like super tight friends from high school. Um, you know, I've got other friends, but like there's something about your core little group. That's, that's, uh, I mean, we were the ones who were taking, um, I saw one of them yesterday, but we, we, uh, we would do mushroom journeys every year. We'd go to Joshua tree and, uh, and just really, really, awesome experience. It's really very like transformative and beautiful. And, uh, um, I mean, there's something about doing mushrooms and running off of the desert by yourself. I don't know <laughs> what it is, man. But, uh, uh, and then that changes obviously as you get older and you, um, uh, my friends having kid having kids, getting married and having kids, uh, makes it harder. And my friend and I were talking about this yesterday cause he, he and I are the only ones that don't have kids yet and aren't married. Um, trying to balance that that need that you that that everyone has that they hopefully carry with them, you know, like to stay in the good, fun place, to stay in the healthy place in their brain and whatnot. Um, uh, it's got to be hard, though, you know. Kids, 
other lives you have to take care of. I want to, I want to be, I want to have kids so bad, but um, it's important. I think that balance is, is really, really important. Do you, do you have kids yet? Or you, you're, you're just no. married? Nope. Okay. Nope. Just married. Don't want kids. Um, I want kids. Okay. No. Um, it's funny. Like I used to, I literally used to tell my parents like, Oh, I'd, cause my, my dad's side of the family is really big, still is. Um, a lot of like cousins, they like mm-hmm. are now starting to have kids, which yeah. is weird because I'm like, you're still children, but you're not. But <clears throat> um, <laughs> it's interesting because I used to think I wanted kids. And I think it was, I, I've kind of realized probably just through tools I've gotten through therapy to just kind of work through my own shit where I was like, yeah. I think it's because like I had a brother who passed away when I was two that oh, I was geez. older than never got to know him and all that kind of stuff to have no memories of him. So it's one of those where I almost feel like it's sort of like a retroactive attempt at that maybe. Um, what having kids would be a retroactive. Yeah. Because okay. it would allow me to be the older protector, the, the, the right. things that you are as an older brother mm-hmm. um, and to help, you know, them grow and teach them and all that kind of stuff. Right. But coincidentally, every woman I started dating in my adult life was like, I don't want kids. And it's kind of selfish to to think that you need to have them. And there are so many children that if you really want a child, you should go get them because they were not wanted and they were brought into this world, out, you know, oh, yeah. without their own, without their say so basically. And so it's kind of changed my perspective. And then as I've gotten older, it's just like, you know, I've tried doing different things in the music industry and I just, mm-hmm. I enjoy kind of being selfish and admitting yeah. that it's selfish and that I would love to just go do something. And, you know, I've, I've said it before on the show, but first time you're hearing it, but you know, something that one of my friends, actually my best friend who does have a kid and has been married for a while has said, he goes, you know, I used you as you and your wife as an example about how like, you know, there's someone that we're really good friends with and they're like, oh, I don't want kids. Cause you know, I don't want to be tied down. I want to be able to go do what I want. And, da, 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 right. and he's like, you've never fucking left this city. <laughs> ever like you haven't done anything like that's a bullshit excuse yeah like you're you know almost 30 or you are 30 like what the fuck are you gonna like what are you waiting for mm-hmm. and he goes like the only people and the only person i know that's ever said that to me like i don't want to be tied down i want to be able to go do whatever is he was like it was me and he goes like he started a podcast he goes and tr- him and his wife travel all the time like they just pick up and we'll go to a show they'll pick up and go you right. know they live in grand rapids they'll pick up and go to detroit and go do something for a night or they'll pick up yeah, and you go. can't do all that stuff if you got a kid obviously yeah no and he was like so he's like you know i i he goes, I'm proud of you for understanding that and actually living the life you say you want to live mm-hmm. versus using it as a as a tool to hide behind or as a right. phrase to hide behind. Um, so it, way, yeah. yeah. So it's it's different for everybody. I uh I don't hate kids, but I also when I like the other day uh, <laughs> like, I, I was I Well, I don't I don't hate <laughs> them. I just kind of sometimes like as a Oh, I just realized that my brain, I think at times is not conducive for having a small child. Cause like I was going grocery shopping and there was a uh, child that started crying and throwing a fit. Cause it didn't go in the door. It wanted to, to go into the grocery store. And I was like, <laughs> absolutely stupid. Like you're going in the fucking building anyway, dude. Like I know you're three and you probably don't understand that, but like, and it's, logic, man. and it's because like, you know, you're tired and you haven't napped or whatever. Like yeah. I get it, but it's like, my brain would be like, we're in the same fucking building, man. doesn't matter if I go in that door or the one over here. Like we're going in this yeah. one. And then I just heard the, the crying throughout the whole store. And I was like, Oh, it is like the best form of contraceptive ever. <laughs> like baby's crying. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I hear you on that. And the, the, uh, uh, especially the selfish selfishness to be able to want to just, just do what it is that you, that you do, uh, unimpeded. You know, I, I, uh, <clears throat> that's gonna be something I'm gonna have to get used to um, when I do when I do have kids because I like to I don't know I like to smoke pot I like to disappear uh, make music and not think about anything else not pay attention to anything else for hours uh, so there's things that are probably gonna have to be tampered down you know uh, but uh, um, I don't know I've, always, I've, I've still always looked forward to having kids I love kids when there's kids around I'm usually the one who's sitting and hanging out with them just because I, I understand. I feel like I understand their brain. Oh, um, that's me and dogs. <laughs> yeah, really? Oh yeah. Actually, no, I'm the same way with dogs too, though. If there's yeah. a dog, I will have a very special relationship with like with most dogs. I will find their personality and I will try and communicate with them because I, I, I don't know. Like I want, uh, I like uh, small beings to, to like me. That's really what it is. I think know? it's more that they are 
pure, pure. Yes, and I've said that about one of our dogs. We have we have uh, four dogs, four adopted uh, uh, elderly dogs. Mm. <laughs> We're like a twilight uh, or sunset, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, home here basically. Um, and one of our dogs uh, named Chicken is this like very vacant little little tiny little thing, and she'll look at you sometimes. You think like, oh my god, there's like nothing behind her eyes. She's completely dead behind the eyes. But the more I've lived with the more I've realized she's just so pure. She has no, no other intention other than just to stare at you, to love you, to get fed, and to go outside. And then, and that's our entire world. Uh, our other dogs have other intentions. They're like, we're going to get into trouble. They're going to go do some shit over here. Because uh, they got their own thing going on. She is so pure. And that's, uh, um, you're right. The purity it's in the kids. It's in kids too. They're not. They're not looking to 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 fuck anything up yet. You know, well, some of them are, but yeah, for the most yeah. part, they're they're pretty. Intentions are pretty obvious. Yeah. Um. No, it's funny. It, actually, it's funny that you mentioned <laughs> taking mushrooms and going out to Joshua Tree. I'm my wife and I are going back through and rewatching Entourage. We're not quite to that episode okay. where where they. Oh, go- did they do that? Oh yeah. Oh, I I have to watch that. I didn't. Yep, I didn't it's like that. season four or five, I think. But then, uh. Eric Roberts leads them out to Joshua Tree to go do on this trip, and it's it's a nice. pretty monumental episode. Um, and it's one of those things like uh, I was actually just again I was just telling the story to my friend the other day when I was getting tattooed. I was like, I haven't done shrooms in a hot probably since I've been with my wife. Um, so it's been twelve years at least since I last yeah. did. I've microdosed on some acid here and there to kind of at least kind of satiate that like psychedelic aspect of things. Yeah. But I was like, man, like every time I've done shrooms, I feel like it's such a transformative uh, experience for me. And it always reveals something to me um, that mm-hmm. I was like, I would be interested to see, you know, almost, you know, two decades later, almost at this point, worth of life experiences and therapy as as another like arrow in my quiver. Yeah. Uh, like, what will it present to me and how will it teach me something now? I think you'll probably be pretty proud of, of, of where you are, especially since you've been doing the work in therapy and like, you know, finding your happiness and stuff like that. It's, uh, I've, I have a friend who, uh, calls them little teachers. Cause that's, that's what they are. You just, you, they're going to show you something and you just, you know, depending on the amount you take, um, you know, what I've been getting into, uh, is just my microdosing. Cause you know, mm-hmm. there's companies the psychedelic, uh, marketplace is going to be popping up here, you know? And so, these companies yep. are already starting their their push, um, so we get uh, some of these like gummies mm-hmm. that are microdose gummies, and it's amazing because I mean I I I've suffered with, with depression for most of my life uh, in mm-hmm. one way or another, and uh, it's amazing these things have made it so it's almost non-existent, and I'm just more focused, um, and it's not like you're tripping. You don't even really, you don't feel the same sort of like, I don't know, maybe every now and then you'll get a little mushroom yawn, like where you yawn and you'll get like, you'll feel like, oh, okay, I feel the mushrooms like in the back of my neck or something like that. Yeah. Um, but microdosing has really been amazing at just like taking all of the shit that's going on and just, and focusing it. It's really, it's really awesome. I do like mushrooms. That, uh, that's sort of been my mo for weed in the yeah. last like three three ish years like is when i started like i've never been into it but like it was like my, i have such an active mind yeah. that i was like it's so hard for me to go to sleep and sometimes like like my parents had actually at one point were like when i was talking about you know smoking and all that kind of shit and they were like well and my dad was i was like you can't say anything dude you smoke you've smoked since i've been around like alive and even before that so like you have no leg to stand on with this yeah and so he was like, well, you say you use it for, for sleeping. And I go, yeah. And they're like, well, like how many hours of sleep do you get normally? And I go, how many hours do I get? Or what, what should I get? Yeah. And I go, cause like, typically I'd say I can probably just used to like four hours and then like I'm up and then I'm up. Four hours of sleep. That's really all, like all you are able to there, Yeah. There yeah. Were, yeah. That's about uh, on average about what I would get. And then it's kind of interesting. Cause like we went to Nashville uh, about a week and a half ago mm-hmm. and would put a pretty good one on like drinking. And then I learned that like, if you're, if I smoke beforehand, like no hangover, wake up great. Oh. But even then, like if I'll have been up at like, like, let's say like we close down the bar. So, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning, go home, smoke. I'm probably up 
by like 7.30. Okay. And I, mean, I, yeah, I have yeah. no hangover. I'm thirsty because I smoked a shitload. But like, <laughs> other than that, it's like, which the water is good for you anyway to rehydrate you from drinking. But it's like, I wake up with like no hangovers. I feel great. I, I feel like I slept better. That's amazing. You found a little hack. That's, that's, uh, that's awesome. It's not for everyone, but yeah. no, I found for me, it works. And even if yeah. I'm not drinking that, like just smoking allows me to be more calm and in the moment uh, before mm -hmm. I go to bed and relaxes me. And then I can have good on like, and I don't even wake up in the middle of the night to like have that, like random, like two 30 in the morning pee or whatever. Like I just yeah. can sleep through. And just then it's like, the yeah. And it's like, man, this is great. Although I had an epiphany the other night where I was like, why does a child need to feel this way? <laughs> what, what are you potentially running away from? <laughs> um, have you ever, have you tried um, uh, CBD sleep stuff? I haven't. I've only used a CBD, uh, a CBD, the hemp's CBD like lotion, uh, right. which so were use something like as a, as a, like a tincture. Thing. Yeah, but no. Even they have like the gummies or, or something like that. Um, Actually, uh, yes. Funny story. We went to Niagara and Buffalo when we were on a trip out there. And we, because it was right around the time that like weed started being legal places. So we went to this like bodega next to our Airbnb. And I was like, yo, they just got like fucking mad gummies like for sale. Like, all right, fuck it. So went in Rome. So I bought them. <laughs> And I, we went to Niagara and I told my wife, I was like, you're going to drive. Like, I'm going to eat these. Like, I'm going to witness the beauty of Niagara while I'm high as shit. Like, this is going to be great. And we get out there and it was like a 40 minute drive from Airbnb. So like, I took one before we went and then I was like, I'm not really feeling anything. So she's like, oh, fuck it. Take another one. I was like, all right. <laughs> so I took another one. And then uh, like, you know, we're overlooking Niagara and she was the falls and she was like, how do you feel? I was like, I'm not high at all. I don't, I think these things suck. And I go, but my back feels fucking great. And then I went back to the B and B and realized that they were CBD gummies. Oh, so they're not gonna, yeah, they're not gonna get you. No, but I, I was just like, man, my yeah, back exactly. feels amazing right now. <laughs> when when they work, when you find the right, because uh, I, I feel like they're not all no. as good. As, no, they're not all really strong. Um, but uh, when they work, you you absolutely feel it. And uh, um, I mean, some of the ones my girlfriend has, I'll I'll, I'll send you a. a a couple of different companies that that might actually work to try, try them out yeah. um but they uh i'm out within like 15 minutes or so 15 or 20 minutes i'm like i'm out i'm out through the rest of the night yeah. um granted i may have been smoking earlier but still because <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't fall asleep early on, uh with weed I, my brain gets too stimulated i want to man I mean, I don't if, know. if i could i would not sleep and just stay up all night fucking making stuff but um you need to sleep in order for your in order to live <laughs> in order to be I mean, alive. you can go on the uh the kramer thing or actually i guess it was it was an einstein with the uh the 15 minute power naps every two hours or whatever you just never sleep at all you just take little little power naps right yeah but then yeah. you end up going crazy <laughs> I, I, no but here's the thing you mentioned kramer i feel like if i did that i would become kramer probably my hair would start ticking straight up and I would just do it would be like that all the time. <laughs> probably was why he was that way. <laughs> why he was. Yeah, um, exactly. No, I, I mean, it, it's so funny. Cause like, I feel like, I feel like at times, uh, you know, like, cause I've been more open about uh, my use of, you know, marijuana and mm -hmm. other stimulants, I guess, or psychedelics and so forth. And it's funny. Cause like a lot of people have come to me and they're like, I didn't know you did any of that shit. And I'm like, well, I don't I'm not advocating doing it. I go, it's, yeah, it's, like, it's not part of my lifestyle. It's not yeah. part of my like persona. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, and I feel like, I feel like that's the thing is like, I feel like, you know, there was, there was that for people where it was like their whole identity was that, yeah. um, you know, something my wife and I joke about is, you know, cause she went to college. She was like, I just hate people like who smoked weed. Cause it had, it was like a, an event and it was like, well, we can't smoke now. Cause we got to wait for Bob to show up and, and then Bob's going to come <laughs> and then we're going to fucking smoke. So like, we're waiting for Bob. And it's like, why can't you all just right? fucking smoke now? Like, who gives a shit? It doesn't yeah. need to be a big production. And I had kind of said the same thing. I was like, yeah, like, I don't make a big to do about what I do. And I was like, so if someone's like, oh, you don't do anything fun like that. I'm like, sure, absolutely. You're right. I don't. But then we'll like talk about something or someone will, some friends will sporadically listen to this show. Like, I didn't know you did DMT. And I was like, yeah, I did DMT once. And they're like, really? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, how was that? I was like, I mean, you heard my experience. <laughs> and they're like, 
well, you just don't seem like the person that would do it. I was like, because I have a healthy respect for all that shit. I was like, and, you know, too often times, like, you know, I li- like next to me is a bookshelf full of, like, uh, memoirs by rock stars who, like, although you see something like the heroin diaries and you're like, okay, you were that loaded on heroin and you were still able to, like, keep some kind of a cognitive diary? Like, go fuck yourself. Yeah. Um, don't believe that. And I kind of thought the same thing even when I was reading it. Um, but it is one of those where I feel like, if you have a healthy respect for these things and you use them as tools to hopefully learn more about yourself. Yeah. That's why they're here, man. Not to overindulge and basically have it take over. Um, I think that's the thing. And that's at least the thing that I've always treated all of these things with, you know, I was actually telling someone the other day, I was like, they're like, how do you feel about ayahuasca? I was like, man, I'd love to do it. I was like, scares the shit out of me. And I was like, but everyone that I've heard that's done it, the thing that intrigues me about it, at least when you have to go to the, the, this different country and these places that are, you know, these guided meditations basically um, is the thing that interests me about it is usually you do it like three days in a row. And the first day is like yeah. fucking awful. Second day is not so bad. Cause you're kind of used to it. And the third day is almost like a clairvoyant moment because you learn, you know, the, I think I forget who said it, but they were like the first day it's like, everything's blurry and you just, you're afraid of everything and you don't understand what it is. Second day, the, the picture and the thing you're working through or on is getting a little bit clearer. And then that last day you, you have the tools to kind of work your way through this. And then that's where the real transformation of, of self uh, and the shedding of self yeah. getting to the, you know, turning yourself inside out essentially and kind of being reborn starts and yeah. that you're never the same once you go through that and that you are infinite typically by all accounts such a stronger individual and in knowing who you are and to me like how do you hear that and not go well i want to do that yeah exactly well just i mean a lot of people are terrified of anything beyond what they think they see you know just on just surface even with themselves a lot of people don't want to get into their shit yeah. um uh you know it's it's hard. It's hard to look at yourself sometimes um, with the, and, and with the ayahuasca thing, I I've never done it, but I've heard again, sure. Great stories about what, what you see, what people have seen. Everyone sees something different because it has to do with your own personal demons that are going yeah. on and they're trying to get out. Um, and, uh, uh, but, and that's, I mean, it's pretty prevalent uh, out here. I mean, it's, there's, places that do it not too far away from my house here where there's like shamans that'll do this. Uh, you go and stay at this house for three days or whatever, even, even just a night. I know people that have done it once have been like, this that is wasn't enough. <laughs> this is, yeah. And they're, they're like, that was, that was an experience. I threw up a bunch. I yep. saw like my dead grandmother and she told me, uh, you know, like there's a spirit in the forest you need to find yada, yada, you know, but like, I'm all about it. I want to try that shit too. Definitely. Um, but, uh, oh, it's funny. You mentioned, uh, when did you say you did, you smoked pot for the first time? Uh, started doing it more consistently, probably like three years ago. Okay. Um, because I didn't smoke at all until my first time was making the audio event record. Mm. And, uh, I was the one who throughout high school was like getting on my friends cases about doing drugs, doing anything that was like, or drinking, doing anything. I was like, you guys are losers. You guys are going to. Because you're going to regret this. You know, I, get in, I get in the studio and I have all three of the other band members going, come on, we got this bong right here. We just loaded it up for you. Just try it. Your brothers both do it. All your friends do it. Just try it. Just try it. Trust me. It's going to make this right recording process. Do you think any band has not gotten stoned when they're in the studio? And I'm like, actually, wait, there's some logic there. Okay. I'm terrified, but I'm going to do it. And that's on video too, actually. That's another one I got to put out of uh, they recorded me smoking pot for the first time while we were recording the uh, audio event record. Do you remember which track you were tracking for at the time? Um, I don't because we took so so long to make the record. <laughs> <laughs> it was a year long process because we had it wasn't just us uh, in there doing it. We had the label, you know, basically going like where's the hit? We don't hear the hit. You know, we need, uh, why don't you guys write a couple more songs or change, you know, change this lyric because no one's going to understand what, uh, what, um, what was it? Uh, I remember meeting with, okay. So we, we, uh, we're going to, we were going to have, um, the guy, Michael Beinhorn produce our record who did He's been on uh, the podcast. Soundgarden corn. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I mean, we loved him. We only briefly got to hang out with him and he seemed to, to like our band and everything and want to do the record. He got, 
offered a corn record after he agreed to that's do what ours. we talked about <laughs> and then uh, yeah and then he he said sorry guys this is a bigger opportunity for me made a lot um, of money off that yeah uh but uh um I remember we were we were working on uh, the energy with him, and uh, the line. I think it's still in the still in the song. Closer to closure, closer to closure. I uh, so. it's in the second closer verse. Closer to closure, every now that one, yeah, that part, yeah. yeah. Um, the song originally, the the chorus had the word closure in it. It was because it was I was writing about breaking up with this girl, so the original chorus was like something like. Uh, Closure takes more than I can give. Something it was like kind of more poppy. I don't know. We uh, the label came in and our and our guy was like, "Closure is not a word for young people. That's like that's like some that's like some like like therapy shit, man. You can't you can't use the word closure. No one's gonna get that. We were so uh, uh, pissed about it, but then we ended up writing the chorus to the energy. So you know it ended up working out. It was fine, um, but. We all were getting into therapy at that point too, so that's I guess why closure was in my head. I was going to therapy for this breakup, and you know, we were going to band therapy, all that stuff. How is that? Because like, you, and not to get too into the weeds on that, but I feel like the only example really we've ever seen of that is some kind of monster, where it's almost like everyone I think has this image of the band therapist going in mm -hmm. and being like, well, I think actually Lars, you should have uh, played this uh, polyrhythm over James's <laughs> thing. Cause it's, you know, I'm whatever. Sure, yeah. it, and it's like, that's not really that, like, that was such an anomaly of what I think group therapy, I guess really in the, yeah. in the true sense of the word is what it is. Cause they're not going to be in the studio with you typically, but um, I mean, in that movie, that guy was right. Yeah. And it was yeah, very was weird. Like studio, yeah, it was very strange. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, it's interesting because we we actually did a VH1 special called uh, uh, Band Therapy, where um, and I, I haven't looked for it, so I don't remember exactly what happened. We went to like the House of Blues in Hollywood and used one of their rooms and shot in there and basically sat around in like cushions. And uh, the therapist that was doing it at the time, he also worked with Incubus for a second, but everyone kind of fell off his radar a little bit because uh, he was starting to sort of. Um, Get into the fame, get into like the uh, to be a famous therapist. I think at least at least what Doctor Drew kind of guy. Yeah, and so everyone was like, "Wait a minute, dude, that's not what this is about." Like we're you know we're we're trying to actually heal uh, our our issues and grow together, and um, you know not to say some of the tools that he gave us didn't didn't help at times, but a lot of them made us kind of walk walk on eggshells all the time with each other, and that kind of made things worse toward the end because. We didn't know how to talk to, how to, talk to each other uh, besides therapy speak and not really getting to the heart of things, but dancing around things. You know what I mean? Um, we were, I'm going to we take were, this hoodie off real quick, so I will, wanna, yeah. not to interject. I just won't be able to hear you for just a second, so hold on. It's okay. I'll amuse myself. <laughs> hand, hand, hand. <laughs> the unfortunate part of living in michigan is like it's snowing outside so you're like oh i gotta dress for the elements yeah, yeah. but then you're also like but i'm also hot in my own home so how's it how's that been man? is it is it dumping outside um a couple of uh i'd say about a week or so. actually it was right before we left nashville um so about a week and a half two weeks ago we got like nine inches in one day oh wow um <laughs> And then we went, it was funny because I was talking to uh, the singer of another band that lives out just outside of Nashville. And on his Instagram thing, he was like, oh, we got two inches of snow. Da, da, da. And I was like, I went outside, grabbed a thing. And I was like, yeah, we got nine inches today. It's supposed to snow tomorrow. <laughs> and then he was like, oh, shit. Like, like, is everything shut down? I was like, no, <laughs> we're used to it. We just, like, life. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, we just deal with it. Uh, yeah. we, 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 be we bemoan like while we're outside shoveling or snow blowing. But like, then same with having a dog. It's like, you know, the wife and I are like, oh, it's your turn to take her out in the morning. And you're like, I don't want to. It's almost, I have been joking that it's almost like Windhoff shit going outside when it's that cold. And you just take like these deep yeah. breaths and you wake up and you're like, yeah, I don't need to get in a shower to do that. I just go outside and take my, <laughs> do my breathing exercises or do whatever the hell I feel like I'm doing. That's sort of yeah. akin to that. But yeah, no, and I know what you mean about those early morning, take the dogs out too. Imagine having four of those that you got to, that wake up at different times. You, so actually we've been talking about getting another dog and something I've been trying to figure out is how do you try to successfully walk two dogs? And that, the only thing I've come up with are those new, uh, well, I guess they're not new, but new to me, 
um, those like harness things that you wear around your waist that's got like the clips on them that you can. Oh yeah, my my um, brother does that. Um, uh, my girlfriend does that sometimes with with uh, some of the dogs. Um, I've never done it, but because my I mean the 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 dog the leash and I was used to walk. Uh, my dog that I brought into situation Zool is a little uh, retractable leash thing. It's yep. almost like a fishing. Yep. Uh, I say it's like flying a kite, a shitty kite. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's like fly, flying a little little fourteen year old kite that's just yep. really <laughs> slow and doesn't want to walk. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah uh, but it's all right. It's all got to get done. <laughs> um, but no, you were you were. I kind of had cut you off unless you were done. You know, talking about just group therapy. Like, do you feel like that was something? Because I feel like a band that young, I feel like that's that's not something a lot of young, like even young people in general would yeah. go to. Do you feel like that's why, and, and not saying you're not friends because you've already addressed that earlier, but like, do you feel like maybe that's why you're still in contact and still friendly with everyone? Because you, you so early on addressed and found ways to communicate with each other like that. I mean, um, maybe, uh, I don't know, the, the, these guys, I... I I got together with at such a young age. I mean, you know, I, like I said, I started playing drums at 12. Uh, and then we started, uh, Ben, Paul and I started um, our first iteration of the band that next morning after my 13th birthday party, because they all slept over. And, mm. uh, and I, had, I had just got started getting to know them anyways, like, uh, but they, I thought they were cool. And Paul, um, Paul was especially, special to me at the time because he especially special because he um he and i used to go to the beach i mean i seen at the beach all the time we grew up surfing and stuff on the beach and uh uh paul really wanted to be my friend he was older than me but he really wanted to be my friend and he really wanted to come to my birthday party so uh because he heard about it he heard it's going to be the cool thing where like you know bands were playing and stuff and he's like i want to you know i want to go to the birthday party so he sees me at the beach and he comes up to me and he goes hey man uh, I heard your birthday soon. I wonder if I can if I can buy you a gift. If you'll you know like want to go over to the warehouse music over here and we'll go get a uh, you know, I'll buy you a tape or something. I'm like, okay, sure. So uh, on the walk over, you know, I invited him to my birthday party. He buys me. Um, remember remember the band Body Count? Hell ST? yeah, yeah. I just went and saw Body or I just went and saw Ice T. You did. And Is Buffalo. he still doing Body Count songs? So Body Count has put out three records. Uh, in the <laughs> I last... about the first one, man. <laughs> no, so Body Count's put out three records in the last like ten years. Will yeah. Putney, who I just aired that episode, uh, he's produced the last three. Oh no shit. Um, and Ice T, when I went to go see my my favorite band, which just broke up, um, which they band? do an annual every time I die. They do oh, okay. a Christmas show, and Ice T uh, went on. He wasn't the headliner, but he was basically direct support for them on night mm -hmm. two. And it's the second time I've gotten to see him do a uh, rap set uh, wow. where he's doing like all the shit off of like, you know, six in the morning colors, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like Nino's theme from New Jack City, like doing all uh -huh. those all those songs. Um, I haven't gotten to see Body Count yet, but I did have Ernie C on and that's pretty fucking close. I feel like to have yeah. uh, to at least get to talk to someone from that band. But a band is incredible and I can't imagine what it was like to, to grow up out in that area like in the height of body count coming out initially. Oh man. But I mean, body count, I, I think about not only body count, but, uh, um, I mean all the bands that when I was in middle school and high school, uh, knowing that they were passing out demo tapes to my brothers got their demo tapes, uh, Rage Against the Machine, uh, Korn. Um, I feel like I remember, I remember hearing tool really early on too. Uh, uh, but they would just get this stuff and, it was brand new. It was like demo tapes. Yeah. And I remember hearing a demo tape of Raising Against the Machine and going, oh my God, this is like the coolest thing ever. I was so, so into it. Um, and uh, first time I heard Corn, I was like, this is like scary. <laughs> and this guy's like, he sounds like a beast. Um, and then Brandon ended up being on the same label as them, you know, for a little bit and uh, uh, touring with them and whatnot. But it's, um, it's really amazing you look back at all the things. And what's funny is I don't really even listen to these bands all that much anymore. Um, my tastes have changed a lot. I, 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 while I still like heavy music and like to write heavy music from time to time, I'm like, I appreciate much quieter music now. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I, I think I also like blew my brain out a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I well, can't headbang anymore. It hurts. I think that's the funny thing, though. I think a lot of people you know, any tour bus or any like touring people I know, like when I go hang out with them or if I 
you know, talk about what, what are you listening to? 99% of the time, it is nothing like what they play or exactly. are on tour with. It's exactly. the farthest, it's the furthest thing. Cause you can't be surrounded by the same thing that much. Like you just no. can't. No. And that's why I think like, for me, that's why I've been trying to branch out a lot more. Like, it's funny when I was telling a friend that podcast as well. And he was like, Oh, what do you got coming up? And I was like, uh, I was like, well, knock on wood. If it actually pans out, like it looks like it's going to, I'm finally going to have uh, Jason from audio event on. He was like, because I think I vaguely remember that band. And I was like, yeah, probably not a band that a lot of people that listen to this show maybe will remember. Mm -hmm. And I go, because everyone just kind of pigeonholes me into it as this like metal dude. And I was <laughs> like, but I go, this is going to be the one where I think the actual downloads will probably be whatever. I go, but this is going to be like one I did when I first started the show and I had uh, the singer from Revis on. Mm -hmm. And they put out very much like yourselves, put out one record. It was fucking incredible did like a couple of decent tours broke up went away yeah. and like but it was before social media it was before anyone kind of could follow people and see like what's happened yeah and that is still i get comments almost every day on that youtube video of us talking because we were like oh my god i was listening to that today and then your video popped up and i watched this long chat oh my god it was so cool um da -da -da -da. and i'm like that's what this is gonna do. I I I just fucking know it. I'm I'm well. I'm 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 happy that we we are going to do this. Uh, um, oh, I'm I mean, glad we're doing it now. It's been a long time coming. Yeah. No. Me. Me too. I mean, I I, I wouldn't have. Uh, um, I don't know. Just a better time now. Anyways. I think I'm like I said to you when we were talking beforehand. It's like I think me going to therapy and realizing that me preemptively steering a conversation because I'm not that OCD. I'm that. I just, that's how my brain works where I'm like, okay, uh, I'll ask these questions and this question's kind of cool, but how do I get there? Cause you can't just ask that question. Okay, well I'll get to these. And then if he says something like this, then it should lead us here. And then I can, I I've had a whole conversation before I've even talked to you yeah. and I'm steering <laughs> you the whole way, like toward shit I want to talk about. And it's like, that's, yeah. that's not how that works. That's not how you like, don't do that to people. So it's well, like, and, and, and I'll end up, I'll end up always tangential. I'll always end up uh, somewhere somewhere opposite from from the question that you asked because yes. that's the way my brain works too but that's yeah that's conversations in general i mean you, you know you should be able to to kind of have these avenues and these different places and then you i mean every every time we've gone we straight away we've always ended up back at a certain point that we made earlier so it's yeah yeah well that's the funny thing about when you have a conversation and more importantly you both are listening yeah you can kind of go like we were saying earlier and then exactly. callbacks <laughs> um i think one of my favorite things that i've been like I wish you would post more, even if it's maybe not your own personal page. You created a separate page for it. <laughs> I do love, like, you know, you had posted a little while ago of, like, uh, you being a zombie and an extra in a, in a film. And you're like, oh, yeah. your description was just like, I'm the one who looks like he's getting blown. And then, like, I read the description first and then watched the clip. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. And then I was like, oh, you're that one. <laughs> Because that's every that's that's what I would see. I mean, I I forgot about that video. I had it on my computer somewhere. I was searching through shit, and I'm like, oh my god, wait, I forgot about this. And I played it, and I didn't remember myself in it at all. I just knew I was one of the zombies. And then I, I see I'm the only one that I see because it looks like I'm in a different movie, basically. <laughs> Going back to your one time watching porn, apparently. Exactly that one that one time, man, <laughs> turned me into a fucking zombie. Damn it! But it was funny because like that reminded me more of the Key and Peele skit of when they were zombies and the and Jordan Peele's character was like the worst zombie ever. And he would just like show him be like, me, 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 me. And then they're like, all right, great. And like, they had him being the like one that did the jump scare or whatever. And, and, uh, uh, keys character is just like, that's, that's not even a zombie noise. Like what the fuck? And like, that's all I can think of is it was just like, all right, you probably got some generic direction. And then you're like, all right, here's what a zombie probably they does. barely gave us any direction. That was like the lowest budget thing that you can imagine. Uh, I think they were like stealing. I think they were stealing those shots, and they just had a bunch of people come. I think I think they paid me twenty five dollars or something to be there. I, I didn't. Care. Honestly, I can't believe you like, got paid. <laughs> no, I, I I didn't even care about getting paid because I was like, I get to be a zombie. Like you're gonna put the makeup on me, and I get to pretend to be a zombie. Of course, uh, acting is really fun, but especially when you get to play a dead person, that's just great. I uh, feel like yeah. uh, I feel like VO stuff, especially after seeing like that clip that is on your most recent post on Instagram. I feel like that would be more fun. Like I've not gotten to do it, 
Mm-hmm. But uh, when I used to live in uh, Lansing uh, for a while, like one of my roommates at the time was like an auteur filmmaker and yeah. like wanted to do this like sci-fi thing, whatever. It was very weird. And we were doing a table read and he was like, all right, well, there's this old guy, like an old farmer person. Uh, we don't have that role cast yet. So who, who just wants to read it? And I was like, me. Yes. And I gave it like the most hillbilly old man accent ever. And they're like, okay, um, we probably don't have the budget to actually make you look old, but we might have you ADR and do all the dialogue. Cause like, that's just <laughs> fucking great. And I was like, yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. And to me, like, like you were saying, like it's fun just creating and playing with other people and yeah. kind of getting to bounce dumb ideas off each other. Like, um, everything's a dumb idea until it's all of a sudden something. So you well, think- I mean, there's a song, my wife, uh, a friend of mine posted so that she was like, Oh, this gives me old, uh, early lady Gaga vibes. And I know she's a huge lady Gaga fan. So I was like, all right, let me check out this song. It looks stupid. Just from the still of the video. I was like, this looks terrible, but like, let's watch it. And the song is called coconuts. And it's a lady talking about her titties the whole time. <laughs> now, unbeknownst to you, and I don't even think I've said it on the podcast. Uh, I work at a bar, uh, working door and like, I had to work New Year's Eve and I was like the amount of titties that are just out right now, basically just like low cut tops. Like, I don't know how like these, like I was like, I texted my wife. I was like, 2022 is the year of the titties. And like, we were talking about something else. How many boobs I've seen this year, just in, from being like proximity around me where I live. It's, (laughs) it's, it's strange. You're not, uh, you're not wrong. It's yeah. Like so the then I see this video. I'm like, oh my God, here we go. Here's the anthem for 2022. Like you're the titties, my coconuts. Yeah. And it's like, I was looking up on, on uh, iTunes to see like who wrote it. Like I was like, these are the kind of songs where like 17 fucking people had to write it. Oh, really? And then I look and there was eight people when she goes, oh, was the artist one? I'm like, oh, no, it was a bunch of men. A bunch of men wrote the song about titties. Yeah. And I was like, sounds about right. Yeah, um, of course. But it's such uh, a stupidly catchy song that you're just like, like I'll send it to you and you're not going to not do. have the fucking hook stuck in your head. It's no, so I, I, I will most likely uh, uh, download it in my, in my brain after hearing it one time and then re- start singing it at some random time. So I'll be like, what is that? And I'll be like, I don't know. Did I just make it up? <laughs> I don't know. But uh, um, uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I hate and I'm also obsessed with stupidly catchy stuff because it's, brilliant that someone can make something that sticks in their head like that but um i also can't get like uh certain things like uh somebody once told me i can't get that in my fucking head i don't like that song but i can't get it out of my head you know what i mean it's, sorry, uh, it's shocking your it, head now too yeah it's i was gonna say it's shocking how many other songs that vocally that somehow works over there's that one dude who does oh that to God. like everything on youtube yeah. and you're like it really does like that melody fits over everything it's, like it's, it's shocking. Crazy. Yeah, it's shocking. Yeah, I yeah, pop music. And that's the thing is like, I can sit there and I'll listen to something. I'm like, I know this is dog shit. Terrible. Like, I I know it's fucking terrible. But like, let me break down why this is actually genius. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you can, you can, you can, you can make the case for why it actually is, is, you know, I mean, you can hear why it's why it's why it works. Um, it's just a it's, I don't know. I That's miss, why I think uh, jingles are so popular. Like, I mean, yeah. you posted a while ago too, uh, and I feel it's so weird being like, "Oh, you posted on this like forever ago," but uh, you had posted that horrible chase scene in uh, Highlander too. Oh yes, that was and, that was a pandemic. Like, I was I watched that scene probably thirty times in a row because I was I was crying. I was laughing so, so hard. So there was um, where's it going with that? Um, oh, Demolition Man. It's one of my favorite movies. Oh yeah. I haven't seen that one forever, though. The fact that, like, their top 40 radio is just jingles. Is that all it is? Yeah. It's, like, there's a station, and it's, like, uh, the, the Armor Hot Dog song was the top song that day, and it was, like, oh, this is my favorite. And, like, her and uh, whatever, like Sandra Bullock and, uh, okay. uh, god damn, why can't I remember the guy's name? He was in Miss Congeniality as well. Uh, the Italian, whatever he is, I don't remember his name. Um, not Sylvester Stallone, but the other actor that was right. in it. But he, they were, like, oh, god, I love this. And it's, like, hot dogs armor hot dogs and like and they're just like singing the jingle and i was like man like that is such a skill to like create a jingle that becomes that like catchy like i mean even look at like i know jim gaffigan has made a fucking joke about it but it's like hot pockets hot pockets yeah. that's all it is two fucking words yeah like so true and, so catchy yeah and then there's a video i don't know if you've seen this but like dave grohl kyle gas from tenacious d interviewed dave grohl 
and the songs and the video is called like right in the hits. Dave Grohl explains right in the hits. And the biggest takeaway and anyone I've ever showed it, like they have the Eureka moments where they're like, holy shit, that is so accurate. He's like, got to write a song like it's a fucking bumper sticker. Life's a bitch. Keep on trucking. And then he kind of like starts writing a song around that. And then he's like, you know who fucking writes the hits? Aerosmith. Aerosmith writes the hits. And he goes, you know why? Because they just have a, they always, the chorus, that's all their songs are. And he goes, loving an elevator. What are the lyrics? Loving an elevator. Like start singing it. And then you're like, yeah. And then he's like, dude, Jamie's, Jamie's got a gun. How does that song start? Jamie's got, and then you're like, holy shit. They really do just start right off with like, like, don't bore us, get to the chorus. And then he's like, yeah, so uh, Aerosmith writes it's uh, chorus, 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 verse, kind of chorus. Uh, <laughs> like, and he's like, and then you get out. Pay off they, the- if, if they put out a record in a while, Aerosmith, I feel like they haven't. I have no idea. I've okay, fallen yeah. off that train a long time ago. Yeah. I think uh, the last thing I remember was honking on Bobo, and that was because my dad bought it, and it came with a little <laughs> tiny harmonica keychain. Oh, my God. <laughs> The gimmicks that gimmicks thing, the gimmicks that uh labels do to entice you to buy stuff. Yeah. Uh I think we we Odd Event probably had some stuff, some like things that we sent out to the uh the radio stations and on like certain markets to try and get people interested and stuff like that. I don't remember exactly what they were, but uh um oh but it's funny you mentioned Aerosmith. Uh we were almost managed uh, in the beginning by Aerosmith's first manager. Um, and I forget his name, really sweet guy though. Uh, and, um, he kind of took them to a point where they were getting super famous and then they got taken over by like a bigger management company, I think. But, um, yeah, I just remember that guy as being, he's a very, very genuine, like fan who just was like, I want to bust my ass. I want to just make my world guys and we ended up going with it, but good guy. But I feel like that's, you know, you had kind of talked about, you guys getting in at a time when the label and, and the industry was shifting and changing. Yeah. Um, I feel like, you know, you can, you know, uh, the owner of mega force records that found Metallica, John, John Z just passed away like a week ago as of mm-hmm. right now when we're recording. And, you know, you hear some of these people like Michael Lago as well. Uh, you hear some of these older, bigger names in the industry. And the one thing I feel like that they have, and same with producers even too, you know, something like the Michael Beinhorns and so forth. Mm-hmm. Everyone had that passion. They didn't care about what they were making. They didn't care about making a name for themselves. They had this passion and they believed in the bands. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like that exists anymore. No, it doesn't exist anymore. It, and it I think that's the biggest, biggest thing I've noticed in, in kind of doing this over five years, talking to so many different people, talking to people in different facets of the industry. I feel like because most everyone I talk to is, is like roughly our age, we still remember when everyone gave a shit and it kind of yeah. meant something like being on a certain label, being having this producer, having, you know, a scene that you came yeah. up with. I don't feel like kids, you know, you're talking about, oh, it was cool getting these demo tapes or going to local shows and, and finding out about this band, this band, this band, this band. Uh, you know, I don't go out to as many local shows as I used to, but I also don't feel like there's a scene either. I feel like everyone no. just kind of creates their one event for themselves yeah. And then they fuck off and they don't like there's no scene anymore. So I feel like it's just you, we talk. I feel kind of like a dinosaur talking about this, how great things were back in the day. And it's like they kind of were. Yeah, they, they, they really were because you just I mean, every generation is going to do uh, whatever it was going to use, whatever exists, uh, you know, to their advantage to to find the things to discover, you know, uh, who they are through their the things they, that they are attracted to, you know what I mean? Whether it be music or art, whatever. Um, uh, it's good to know that it's, that it does, it does still exist on some level. I went, um, a couple weeks back to, uh, a friend of mine's son is a, a musician. He was playing drums. He's, I think maybe 15, 14 or 15. And, uh, so we went to go support and it was all, like high school kids at this little, at this, um, I think it was like a skate shop that they maybe like made a venue after hours, but the place was just packed with kids. It was like rock music again. Like I was hearing young rock music again. And it sounds like it's all, they feel like young rock music always kind of sounds like some version of the same thing, you know? Uh, but it was awesome. It was, it was inspiring to know that that's, that's still going on, that these kids were actually, all packing in this teeny tiny little place, even through, even through COVID, just like, 
they had to be there. They had to see this thing. It reminded me of growing up, uh, you know, and playing shows um, around us in the in the uh, in Los Angeles here at the little before we could play clubs, you know, um, at coffee houses and stuff like that that were set up for this. Um, that kind of excitement it needs to exist in order for this. People need to find, feel like like what they're experiencing is special in that way, and I, I I mean I hope to be a part of creating something like that for for people again and for kids definitely, you know. Uh, but yeah, that it does still exist in in some form. I, it's it's harder to find, and we don't get demo tapes at our schools anymore or anything like that. But um, oh man, one of one of my favorite things that we would do uh, growing up was, um, and I miss this. This was it was hard work, but I miss it going around to the different schools and different parking lots and stuff and putting flyers in lockers and uh, hawking the demo tapes and trying to sell, t- sell tickets to our shows and stuff like that. It was a real on the ground way of knowing that you're doing the work. And uh, uh, that's, we, we busted our ass when we were little. That's all we did. You know, we didn't get into trouble. We didn't do anything else other than every single day we came home from school and went to the garage and rehearsed and wrote. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, I, I definitely missed, I, I missed that aspect of it. Um, I know I'm off what you were originally talking about, but I started going no. down memory lane and thinking, no, like, it, it's really funny. Nice. As soon as you said that, it reminded me of a show I booked, uh, many years ago now. And I'd had success, like at this venue, it's of like 420 cap room. First show I'd ever done in an actual venue. I almost sold it out my first time. Wow. Uh, but I think it speaks more to the the show and the bands I, I had picked. And so this one, like I was like, all right, like, you know, I'd had some like eh, shows and I was trying to figure out a way to like entice and get people who maybe wouldn't have gone. Yeah. But I got a way to get to them. And so what I did was I started doing audio flyers and um, I would create, like I put like, so yeah, this sounds so old, but like, you know, like the old CD, like sleeves, like uh-huh. the single CD sleeves. Yeah. So I would make, I spent and made a little playlist, two songs of each of the four bands I had. So like an eight song CD, I put the flyer in there and then like, I left it at the venue. I went to the record store. I went hey, to like, hot Hop, like I went to all these places yes. and I basically put an audio flyer mm-hmm. and then to entice other people, I, I like stuck in an, a free ticket here and there. Like, so like you might open up and be like, Oh fuck, I got a free ticket. Um, so maybe you that. might just randomly come to a show because you got a free ticket and you had nothing yeah. else to do. And it was kind of interesting to see how quickly those CDs went. And I was like, are people just grabbing them because like they're fucking free or they like whatever? Like are people actually listening to them? Yeah. And that was the part that kind of sucked because like I didn't I, I had no way to track that. Right. But I was at least I felt rewarded in the sense that like everywhere I would leave a stack, they would be gone like a day or two later. Um and we did probably just under 400 people out of that 420. So again, we wow. almost pulled out that room, and it was one of those where I was that like, be "A good idea, man! Shit, that's, that's so." A- it was it when you said like going and flyering the old school way, mm-hmm. putting flyers up. I was like, that like I feel like again putting in the work. Like I felt good when like the venue gave me the promoter or the local yeah. person settled me out, and I was able to pay like one of the headlining or the local headliner like 1,200 bucks, and I'm like. Man, you fucking busted your ass. You sold these tickets. Here's twelve hundred dollars. You played yeah. a show like minutes from your house, and I was able to pay everyone else equally as well. And I still yeah. walked away with a shitload of money. That's and it was amazing. one of those where I'm like, "This is what it should be like." Mm-hmm. But sadly, it's the outlier. And and shortly thereafter, like trying to do things like that again, it's like, "Hey, I did this, and this seemed to have success. Let's try to do something similar." And everyone was right. like, "No, uh, uh-uh. uh." And you're like, "Well, the the CDs cost money, or this cost time." And it's like. Okay, well, a Facebook post only does so much. So it really, and it really barely does anything because people look at things and eh, and they go right past it. And even if they are like, oh yeah, they mean to go back to it, they're gonna fucking forget about it. You know? Yeah. Um, so, but yeah. that was. It's funny that you said that because it, it sometimes I feel like the old way of doing things still works because it's it yeah. worked for a reason. Well, I'm gonna when when uh, when we come play out near you, I'm gonna I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm going to need your help in getting people in the place. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to. It's funny because there are times like when I see bands uh, that like I'm friends with and they're like, um, like I'll have to send you a video uh, when we're done. I have to send you a lot of shit apparently. Yeah. Um, send but me all man, the band Emery, like they have traversed turning 
into an older band very interestingly you know they they own their own label they put out their music on their own Mm -hmm. they own their masters they do all that stuff a lot of times they crowdsource uh the funding for their records either through like a a fan club kind of thing that they do Mm -hmm. where it's like we're we're gonna put out x amount of songs like two songs a month uh you'll get them da 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 and then eventually it'll become the record that we put out right. and mass produce, whatever. Um, touring, a lot of times what they do is like house shows or like coffee shops, uh, but they have it super limited. They regulate it themselves where it's like, okay, like, you know, they hit up people and they're like, we're going to do a house show, acoustic house show tour. Uh, if you live in any of these areas, hit us up, send us a photo of what you got, how many people you think you can fit. We'll go from there. But they're wow. going to play Detroit. And I have a basement that's like old, like it looks like a shitty 70s basement uh, that people were probably tortured into watching like, people's family vacations on um and so i was like hey i know you're looking at detroit but i live in grand rapids i'm on the way to chicago so either you can do an extra date here or whatever probably i was like i've done house shows here typically we can get about a hundred and some odd people like packed in there Mm -hmm. Um, but like you know for something like what you're thinking we, we could probably do like 50 60 70 pretty easily and they're like fuck yeah we're coming here we're not doing detroit and then that's built a relationship between me and those guys that's so cool um and but like they do it, it's kind of expensive. It might be like fifty bucks a ticket, but like it's all. But it's a very, thing. it's it was, a very intimate show, obviously. Yeah. And that's the thing is that like you know they come hang out, like they spend time with you. And to me, I feel like it's an interesting way to capture the fan base you have, mm-hmm. but not having to go through the system of like, okay, like this is the room rental, this is our split. Like you get money if you do X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Like the things I've learned from booking shows. And it's just streamlined. We're going direct to consumer, basically, to use like you know, business terms. Yeah. And it's been interesting to see bands do that and kind of having success. Excuse me, in that capacity, and it's kind of made me be like, maybe that's the way to kind of do some shit. Like, if, like I don't, I know that may not work for everybody, but it's like audio event. We're gonna do. And we're going to do it in sections. We're not going to do a full tour, but it'll be like, we're going to do a week's worth of shows. We're hitting the West Coast. This mm-hmm. is what we're doing. Now we're going to hit the Midwest. We're going to hit the East right. Coast. If you can make it out to this, awesome. If not, we'll try to come around and do something else another time. Yeah. But it creates creates an interesting buzz of those that want to support you and want to be there. Yeah. And it gives them something that is not like any other show experience they would get. That's And, and, and I've been thinking about that Anyways, so it's interesting you're bringing it up and thinking about, okay, what's the best way to approach uh, uh, the the actual tour aspect of things uh, without knowing what a market is like, really? And that's the the thing you did with that with Emory is a that's a good example of like, oh, you can actually gauge by saying like, oh, we'll do some house shows and, you know, how many people you think you can get here? You know, you're kind of basing it on like the fan base and whatever, you know, probably not a major market, you know, and uh the people that are not in the major markets are going to be way hungrier to see a show anyways. Um, but I, 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 I kind of like the idea. I like the more intimate stuff anyways. That's just, it's just, it's just funner. There's, there's more, I want to actually have a real, real connection with, uh, with people uh, this time around. It's, um, uh, I don't know. It's more fun. I want to, I want to learn more about the people that are actually enjoying what I'm doing. Cause it'll probably teach me more about myself too. Well, I feel like at that time too, and it seems like it's definitely right up, you know, everyone in the band's thing mm-hmm. it allows you to kind of take control of everything yourself. Like you don't have, exactly. like, you know what, what you're expecting, you know what you're getting into. And I feel like at that point, like it will allow you, like, I'm sure yes, going on an actual tour, maybe getting a bandwagon, hiring a driver, doing all that. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, like that would be comfortable and convenient, but I feel like the one thing, that's been nice in seeing it with Emery's. I feel like it has reinvigorated them. It's, it, it, it's more, it brings you back down to like where you started and it yeah. makes you, and that's something that's funny. That's something I said uh, to the guys uh, when Adi Van actually broke up was uh, my head was in that place where I was like, um, I kind of want to, st- I would love to like start over with, with this process and then like find the ground level, uh, um, you know, the grit that we, that we had before the, the, the passion for just, you know, playing music every single day and just loving it, loving it, needing to do it. Uh, toward the end there, we were, um, Atlantic wasn't signing off on anything we were, we were writing. So, because we got a new a guy who didn't really like us. Uh, he was like a hip hop guy, not a rock guy. So he was just not signing off on anything we were writing. So we just were perpetually writing music and it started getting worse and worse. And we started getting worse and worse personally. And, uh, so, 
when we were about to make a second record, that's when we broke up. It was uh, <clears throat> it was yeah, it's around that time. And uh, but I would I would love. I mean, you're mentioning this, and it's given me so many so many ideas of uh, it'd be really cool. I'd actually like to do some kind of a like a like a house tour type type situation. Um, so yeah. And you know what? Your fans are probably old enough now to have cool spots. <laughs> they, you, know you know what's awesome is that I, I, I get I get uh, emails from people and mess, social media messages from people introducing me to their kids and sending me videos of their kids like rocking out to the album and stuff. And it's like it's it's really cool because these these all these people were kids when they were when they were first discovering us. It's just so, so cool. You. They're passing it on to another generation. And their kids are now like, my favorite song is Looking Down or whatever, you know what I mean? And they're always doing this when they're saying that. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is my version of kids. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. very much so, like the robot. Yes. <laughs> um, no, I, I think that uh, I think that would be a lot of fun. I mean, even like you see like that documentary the Foo Fighters did where they did, they picked like, I think 10 people or eight people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. they played the house shows basically. Yeah. And I submitted mine for that, and I thought maybe I might have a, a good shot at it, but I guess my house wasn't cool enough. Compared to some of the others, I was like, well, I mean, this is a dude's barn, like, in the middle of nowhere. Like, that's mm -hmm. not fair. You said a basement or, like, a garage, like, not a barn. They, they, yeah, they probably were thinking, okay, what's big enough for us and also going to gonna look the most, like, cinematically cool yeah. or whatever, whatever they were thinking. But, like, that was still even, like, that was kind of around the same time Emery started doing their thing, and I was like... I feel like there's just something, I mean, I've done a couple other house shows since, but and I don't, again, I'll send you one that was wild as shit. Like 150, pe 150 people paid uh, 10 bucks a piece to come in. Plus the bands and like myself and pe other people I knew that I was just like, just fucking show up. Um, but it was like a old, like hardcore, like a legit hardcore show had a yeah. pit in my basement. Like part oh of my scene that got knocked out. Uh, the benches that the people were sitting on that are built into the walls broke. Um, <laughs> like it was, it's fucking intense. Um, but it's one of those, like, to me, it's like, I see things like that and like, it just gets me excited. It makes me feel like it reminds me of why I love going to see live music, why I mm -hmm. love supporting bands and musicians when I can. Cause it's like, there's just something so raw and visceral about being in a room and having a shared moment like that with people. Oh, like, absolutely, man. So those were some of my actually, and, and I mean, in, in later years, this was probably, uh, I mean, I stopped doing these shows uh, maybe like a year, yeah, a couple of years ago. Um, when I was living in uh, Venice Beach, I had a uh, um, a residency at the townhouse there, which is a little, little. it's like the oldest bar in Los Angeles, basically. It's an old speakeasy in the basement. Mm. And um, I had an awesome residency there where uh, I had three different projects, one called Ghost Light Orchestra, one called Picturas, and one called Surgeon Boyd all were um they all kind of led into the into the other ones as like one band people couldn't get together as much so i formed another band with some of those people and then a few more of the other people and then surgeon boyd was kind of a breakdown more of like whoever could show up for uh, for the shows and then sergio my guitar player from those three bands and i were made were the main writers basically and like you know putting it together but we had some shows where uh toward the end all we were doing was just improv sets essentially it was just, they were like jams, but they would turn into, sometimes it was awful. Sometimes it was, <laughs> sometimes though it was fucking magic. It was like, it was psychic uh, where, uh, and that's one of my favorite things about music in general is when you're playing with, collaborating with, other, collaborating with other people, you're in a room together and you don't have to look at each other and you know exactly where the other person is going to go. You, you uh, uh, magically, I, crescendo up into this part and I start singing like at this note and then Sergio the guitar player would would immediately without even knowing where I was going match my note or or hit some sort of a, a, a like it's octave or harmonize with me in some way it makes some sort of a thing that's almost similar to the melody that I'm doing and it's it's uh the times that would happen live I mean because we get we would happen that would happen in rehearsals all the time but then the times it would happen live with just uh, completely improv sets it was like better than sex. It was incredible. Well, I shouldn't say better than sex, but it was it was sex. <laughs> Group sex. <laughs> One of my last questions for you, because I feel like I've kept you uh, longer than maybe I had in, I told you I would. It's okay. Um, it's making up for lost time. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, you again had posted, and I, I wanted just to hear this story. Yeah. So, uh, you were playing at a uh, looks like just kind of like maybe a company gather or a company function or something, and you're wearing a captain's jacket, and you said <laughs> that Coolio's band had finally gotten off, and you got to play. Yeah, what? Because what? I've We've kind of seen Coolio over the years now, and he seems a bit aloof, uh, to put it mildly. Yeah. What uh, what was that experience like? Because I feel like there's more to the story than you, or maybe not, that you put in well, your, your caption. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, there there, def- there definitely is. There's a there's a lot to that story. I mean, Coolio himself was a he was a real character. He was he was a he was uh, more more of a character than I could have imagined he would be. Let me just say it. Let me just say it that way. Um, he, I mean, first of all, he left the party and ended up coming back at like three in the morning looking for a, a certain girl that he saw earlier. Like, and everyone's like, Coolio came back by himself. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, he was, he was, he was really, he was really cool and everything. Really interesting guy and like put on a great show. Was, his band was some of the best musicians I'd heard in a long time. Like they mm. were incredible. And, um, uh, but, but uh, before he played, uh, no, after he played, this is when he came back. This was a little, a little later. We'd already played and everything, and we were sitting around the a fire pit, like smoking a joint or something. And he comes up, and he's seen my jacket because I was wearing the jacket all night. And he comes up behind me and he goes, "Hey, man, I like a jacket." I'm just like, "Oh, thanks, man." I'm thinking to myself, "Cool, you like my jacket? This is awesome." And he's just like, "Better watch your ass in the parking lot. I'm gonna beat your ass and steal it." He basically like, and I couldn't tell if he was serious or what was going on, but he basically told me like, "I will beat you up and steal your jacket." <laughs> 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 you, up your jacket. you better watch yourself because I like that jacket and I want it essentially. So it was a weird backhanded way of giving me a compliment. Uh, it was a Coolio way of giving me a compliment, but uh, you know, what are you do? <laughs> um, we, we're, we've put, so we've played now with Coolio's band uh, with um, who played and then who played. Uh, the other time, um, uh, Warren G. Oh shit! I think it was Warren G. And the guy who he sang with on that uh, hey, regular, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think they came and performed too. At uh, it was one of these like super rich person parties they hired us to play. Essentially, uh, uh, really fun. Uh, but by the time we got on stage, it was so freezing and the. Uh, um, the wind had started picking up, so everyone moved away from our air, from the from the, like the crowd, <laughs> the heaters over like off. So we were playing to nobody essentially. Um, the the lyrics we did a bunch of cover songs. The lyrics were all blowing off the stands. It was kind of chaos, but it's all right. It was fun. I always had fun. So I uh, I don't think I've told this story on the podcast, but it's I think it's funny. Um. So talking about when I used to book shows, yeah. uh, very much like the podcast was trying to branch out and just do other cool shit that I was into. So uh, my wife and I, when I lived in Ann Arbor, uh, we went to go see like a, a hip hop's like greatest like hits kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It was DMX, Naughty by Nature, Slick Rick, Rakim, uh, uh, somebody else I'm, th- I'm blanking on. Um, but like yeah, just DM- all- DMX too. Such a great guy. He was a really, really nice guy. Oh yeah. Got to see him right before he passed away. Um put that down a little bit more. Um, but it was one of those things where I was like, all right, naughty by nature is fucking dope. I really want to get them. Um I feel like they can't cost that much because they don't I don't know. I just feel like maybe they're not that much. Um so I found somehow through like back when you can find a lot of this information on the old Facebook, like before, mm-hmm. like they redid it. Now you can't find anyone's information. Um, I'd reached out to the management they had or their booking agent. And I was like, look, I booked shows. I'm thinking like, this is where I'd like to do it. I think like we could easily sell out this room. Typically when they do hip hop shows of this realm with kind of more nostalgic acts, you know, the price points around this to this. So I think we could definitely be in line, do some business, mm-hmm. uh, be a great show. I know you could buy like we're a B market, but you guys could probably easily tack on Detroit, Chicago, you know, mm-hmm. call it like a nice weekend or something. Um, so the guy was interested and I was surprised at how easily I was able to talk my way into to getting a show. Right. And then it came down to finances and more importantly, the writer. Yeah. 
And so with them, as I'm sure like a lot of artists uh, of a certain caliber, it's like, you know, you have to pay half of the guarantee up front and then the other half as soon as you show up. Uh, but they wanted it in cash, like when they showed up, like not a check or anything, like it was just straight cash. Um, and the, the the amount was quite a bit more than like I thought was worth it because I was like, I don't even remember asking the guys, like, is it literally going to be the same show I just did, I just saw in Detroit? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, so they're playing three originals and it's all covers. And I was like, I don't feel like that's worth blank. Like for that kind of a show, for that kind of a set, I would hope that they would play. Like, I want to hear this. I want to hear this. And like, and I, cause I like naughty by nature. And he was like, well, you're what we call a niche fan. You actually like the band. Uh, <laughs> most people who are going are only going to hear oh, hip hop no. Ray, uh, feel me flow. And, uh, whatever the other single was, I'm blanking on OPP. And yeah. I was like, all right, well, I, I have a hard time paying that at that point. So he's like, okay, well, we can kind of sliding scale the guarantee. And I go, okay. And then I went to the venue and was kind of like, hey, I'm looking at getting them. Like, And they're like, oh, we'll, we'll help out as, as much as we can, even potentially with some of the money, uh, if you owe money up front or whatever, because we yeah. believe it'll do well. And finally comes down to, I was like, I'm not willing to pay more than, I think the number I came up with was like, like maybe 12,000 or 15,000. So I was like, that, that's the only way I can make the numbers work. Yeah. um the cap is a hard cap like we can't fuck around with that and i was like and then the guy comes back to me he's like well at that point we'll we'll perform like 20 minutes for that amount and i was like wow everyone would be pissed if they spent yeah. that kind of money and got a 20 minute set like go fuck yourself uh but then i got the writer and the writer was even funnier because it was like uh treach wants like magnum condoms we need like, you know these bottles of ciroc we need this we need a white escalade and a black escalade to pick up uh -huh. treach and uh, uh vinny and it like very just, particular. Very it was particular. it was a very particular writer and at one point i i countered and i was like well i was like again i don't think the condoms are worth it because literally i saw treach just grab them out of his pocket and throw them into the crowd so that's wasted <laughs> money uh the i go the bottle of booze that you're talking about me getting is really expensive and i go and literally treach took a pull off of it during the tupac medley and then just gave it to the crowd yeah. and i go so if all he's doing is all those things how about i buy something else that's cheaper because it's not really going to them it's kind of a, a thing that he does for the crowd it's and i was like i'd rather sure. i'd rather put that money back into paying you guys and they did not go for that. And then he's like, and then, but this is where it gets funny. And you reminded me of this. The promoter goes, okay, well, if not in my nature is too much, uh, if you think you can do around five to eight grand, we can either get you Bismarck e or Warren G. Oh. And then I was, and then he, he was like eight for biz five for Warren G. And then I was like thinking to myself, I was like, and Nate dog had already passed away at this point. And I was yeah. like, is five grand worth it to hear regulators could I even tell him you're playing regulators up front and you're playing it on the back end of your set too. So you're playing it twice. Um, and then I was just wow. like, ah, I just don't know if I can, I don't know if people would come out for Warren G at that price or Bismarck, sadly. And you know, now he's passed away too, yeah. but it was just one of those. I was like, what a used car salesman approach. Like, okay, okay. So we can't get you in a naughty by nature today, but we still want to get you something off the lot. We've got this, this weird pink, <laughs> Pink, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> like hatchback yeah. in the back that uh, yeah. you think you might be able to afford. Um, not that uh, Warren G is a hatchback, but still. No. Uh, uh, he'd be, a, he'd he be an old caddy. Nice. Yeah, yeah maybe an old caddy. He was also very nice. His, his band was amazing, too. Yeah. Um, All the hip-hop cool. dudes always have great, great have musicians. Great bands. And, yeah. and uh, the, it's funny, um, something that was on Coolio's writer uh, that he insisted upon um, that I think one of the other acts ended up eating because there was two, there was two like famous hip hop acts that, that showed up for this one of these parties and Coolio had wanted um, fried fish from this really like bad drive through play, like a, like a fast food. Like Something. Yeah. I don't even know what it was exactly, but it was like, uh, um, it was like really, really bad fried fish, but apparently he he loved it. But then someone ate it and he got pissed, and so he was wondering who ate my who ate my fucking fish. You know, <laughs> it's like it's on my rider. I specifically mentioned that I wanted this specific thing, and somebody ate my fucking fish. So yeah, on uh, Naughty by Nature's rider, it said no fish. Within there was actually a specific. Like boundary. distance, <laughs> distance that you could not have fish near, and I want to oh, say it was man. at least fifty feet. 
They didn't uh, want to sell the fish. Yeah. Yeah. But they, well, they didn't want fish at all. Like that was the weird thing. It was just like no fish. And then the best part was though, is the venue that we were looking at booking them at doesn't have a green room. It's like literally is just a back room that like basically holds all the bands backlining essentially. So they yeah. can just wheel their shit and a bathroom and a like, uh, like Arby style or like a Denny style, like corner booth kind of a mm -hmm. thing. And that that's it. And so they were like, yeah, in the green room. And I was like, oh yeah, there's no green room. So like, y'all are going to have to like, just stay in your fucking escalades or something. Cause I ain't going to work. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not getting you a day room. <laughs> hotel room down the street, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. That was the other thing. They wanted a five star hotel room or, and this was literally written. I have to count it to make sure I have the correct amount of them. A really, 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 really nice uh, four, three to four star hotel. They had that many reallys in there and they like in a contract. <laughs> it was like in the parentheses, it was like a five star hotel or oh. a really, yeah. And I was just like, okay. <laughs> like, it's so weird when you start getting into that side of things and you're just like, yeah, this shit is like, I mean, I think it, you, I was, I think I priced it out. That would have tacked on easily another like six grand in shit that was on their rider. Oh, Jesus. Well, that, I mean, that must mean that they they get it sometimes. You I know? mean, yeah, someone, they have someone to. Pay it. Yeah, someone has to pay it. Like, and that's yeah. the thing. What was the crate? What was the most extravagant thing you guys asked for on your rider? Um. Okay, so we did. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to think of if we actually ended up asking for anything weird. Uh, we definitely played some played a couple of little random tours that were. Uh, strictly for the money and no one was there so i think we actually asked for weird random shit on our riders and we got it uh but we did this like jack daniels tour when they tried to put out like a hard cola or something <laughs> oh, yeah i remember that remember that it was a brief <laughs> brief thing they tried I to do remember something that and they and so they thought okay this is our marketing employee we're gonna get audio vents because everyone knows audio vents. <laughs> we're gonna get audio vents and we're gonna get uh saliva <laughs> <laughs> and these two bands are going to do a tiny tour for Jack Daniels Hard Cola, and uh, we're going to give them way too much money, and we're not going to do any promotion, so no one's going to come to the shows. Uh, it was so weird, but we drank a lot of really weird Hard Cola. Uh, we definitely got very drunk uh, the whole time with the guys in Saliva, who were also really nice. Um, but uh, again, we didn't really want to be on tours like that. We didn't really want to be with bands like Saliva or anything like that. We we only did. We actually only did weird tours, to tell you the truth. Well, I was going to say, you you guys, interestingly, like, you know, kind of going, again, back to, like, what we were talking about earlier, there's not really a whole lot of bands that when you came out that you, that would have fit at the time. No. Like, no. to me, like, I would look at a band, like, again, they're weird in and of their own right. Um, but I feel like a band around that time that would have been kind of good fit for you because they, they aren't any one thing either would have been, like, a band like Alien Ant Farm. Oh, we were friends with them too. Yeah, that's that's what's so funny. Uh, um, and they were, you know, they were really nice guys to us as well. Uh, still hear their song every now and then on uh, Jack FM out here. They play. It's like one of those stations that plays like just all the things from from your childhood and then from up to now, like all the catchiest stuff over and over and over again. They still play uh, Smooth Criminal cover. Smooth Criminal. Yeah. God, they that. It's so it's such a bummer that band is and was so much more than that one song. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I it's mean, but it's it, it's thankfully they I mean they they grabbed on to something they got a little little foothold in something so they're still getting paid a little bit for that. You know. Yeah. Here's a, here's a I've never asked this and maybe you're not the one to know but maybe you do. Do bands get royalties off of like the internet jukebox things? Um. Internet jukebox. Oh, you mean like sites that have like a so like touch tunes? Like you go to a bar, you'll see like the internet jukebox where you can go in, and it pretty much has like unless the bar has specifically said like no hip hop, no whatever. You can go in in theory, pick up pretty much everything. You know, I I, I don't know. Um, uh, I, I know right now actually, and see if you guys are even on that. Okay, I've... yeah. Um, you know, for the most part, with that kind of stuff, I feel like uh, I'm still getting notice of places that. Um, like I'm, I'll still get random notices of, oh, you're owed this amount from, you know, we found this company that's been using your music for a little you while. You are actually on there. Oh, we're on there. All right. 
So in theory, then that might be another. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully, revenue we should be getting paid. You know, <laughs> you're welcome to send me ten bucks yourself, man. <laughs> oh, sorry, no, no, sorry, fifty cents, most likely, because uh, I think I need to rip a penny in half. Yes, that's what and you then, should do, and then yes. I give you that every month. Yes, rip penny in <laughs> half, and then rip it in half again. Yes. Yeah. And then you got to split that uh, four or five ways. Yes, I got to. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, Hold on. Uh, You actually need to give a part of that, probably an eighth uh, to your management and the label to recoup for the uh, million dollar uh, stakes and all those kind of things. That's right, because I'm still in debt here. So, yeah, I'm still in debt with Atlantic Records. (laughs) They're coming out of my house next. That's Um, it. Those are the those are the weird stories, too, that I've heard where it's just like, yeah, well, I thought you took us out to stick. No you had to recoup that. <laughs> yeah. You took yourself out to steak dinner and actually we got a free dinner on you. Uh, but it's all right. It was all part of the fantasy at the time. Uh, and um, better for it. One last, uh, cause I, I love asking this question. Sure. I don't know if you technically own the rights to this at this point. Right. Um, I, I don't either, uh, the, the publishing, I asked Ben about this a couple months back and I don't think he knew either because, um, I think our publishing deal with, with, uh, Warner Chapel, I think we had, I think that may have run out by this point, but regardless, I was talking to Ben about doing like the Taylor Swift thing where if we'd be like, Hey, you want to re-record some of the old songs, maybe make them a little more updated and see what happens, you know? Kind of um, where I was going with it. I was going to yeah. say, if your sunset clause is up on on that, yeah. uh, of either would you re since you were talking earlier, and this is kind of what made me think of it, of re-recording some of these uh, or the whole thing, even maybe, yeah. But more importantly, then putting it out on vinyl. Oh, I would love to just have. I mean, I have all of the other music that I've made, all the other um, things that I've made with my other projects, has spurred me into a place where I'm like, I need to have some stuff on vinyl because I have nothing. Uh, I think I think they pressed a couple copies of the I event record on vinyl for like special things, but we never got one. Hmm. Um, now you're about to send me down a rabbit hole is when we're done with this to go look for it. I mean, so, yeah, someone someone may have one because I know they were like they made a couple for like promotional things, but um, yeah, because I've gotten much more into records now as you know as I've gotten older and whatnot. And it's just it's. Just be cool. You'll be yeah. on a record and be like, "Yeah, this is my record, actual record." <laughs> well, this has uh, been a lot of fun, and thank you so much for the time. I know it's like we have joked several times; it's been a long time coming. Long time, um, yes. but I think it uh, actually worked better for the, the those who will end up listening, and, and more importantly, even if no one listens, uh, just for you and I to, to kind of bullshit for two hours and absolutely have a good time uh, talking about old things and who we are as people versus who we were, and uh, all that, and hopefully. Uh, I'm sure maybe we'll stay in contact and maybe I can help uh, figure some things out for uh, like a small house uh, house event tour. I would love that, man. I would love yeah. that. Yeah. This has been, it's been really fun. This is yeah. my first time doing doing one of these uh, in this way. So it's uh, it's nice. Yeah. Well, and me. when there's no pressure. <laughs> yeah. So that was my conversation with Jason Boyd. I uh, want to thank him again for for taking two hours uh, to to bullshit with me, and it was a lot of fun. Like I said in the intro, like sometimes when you do some of these chats, you know, you've been working so long to get someone that you're like, oh man, like is this ever gonna happen? And and what is it gonna be like? Um, you know, like I said in the the conversation, um, Jason was one of the probably the 10 people I had on my like kind of like weird beginning bucket list for, for guests I wanted to have on the show. And you know, some of my bucket list guests aren't like people you may think of like where you're like, Oh, you definitely want to get, you know, Jonathan Davis, or you want to get, you know, Daryl from Glassjaw. It's like, I do want to get those people, but sometimes it's, it's these musicians and these people who existed in a time and only had a short lived career that I find more interesting, you know, one of the ones that one of the episodes it it hasn't done great as far as the actual downloads of the the audio uh, is Justin from Revis. Like that is an episode, like I said, that gets so many comments almost every day. Like you know, it's it's got thousands of views and hundreds of comments, and it's one of those where. I think that's that's the fun thing about doing this podcast sometimes is, you know, and doing I talk about this quite a bit is it's the people that 
you don't hear from very often that do the best or it's the, it's the weird episodes that do the best because it's just so different. And I know this, this one may not be the most downloaded when I, when I put it out in the audio format, but I know this is going to be the one where I'm like YouTube, it's going to do very well. Um, because people, people my age, a little bit older, uh, that loved that band, you know, they probably don't have the CD anymore and they probably go to YouTube and they watch the videos or they listen to, you know, the, the playlist of the record on there because I see the comments on those videos where they're like, who here in 2021 still coming back and listening to this band? Who wishes they would have put out more music? So on and so forth. And those are the kind of people that are going to stumble across this chat and hopefully really fucking enjoy it. Um, I know I enjoy talking to Jason and the whole time it was just really cool getting to connect with someone that, you know, I grew up really enjoying their lyrics and just, you know, them, but it is, it's really interesting sometimes getting to do this podcast and getting to talk to some of the people that I initially set out to have on the show when I started it over five years ago and kind of collecting them. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely a wild trip when these happen and it just feels so good, you know, three years in the making to get Jason and, you know, he's finally on and we've had the conversation and it was so rad. Like, uh, sometimes in life that doesn't always happen. You don't always have that high expectation and the the long delayed gratification of getting the thing. Um, you know, too oftentimes now in today's world, we can get whatever we want at the, the snap of a finger. And, I feel like sometimes we forget how rewarding it can be to to have it take a while to get something to have a, a you know a success a win or whatever. Uh, I think we forget those things. Uh, so this was a, a great example for me personally with the podcast and all that to just kind of reflect and think back to uh, where the show was, who I was when I initially had reached out to Jason, and, and just how much you know I've grown since then. Uh, it's it's an odd measuring stick at times. Uh, time being the measuring stick of, uh, of these things. So want to thank Jason so much, uh, for kind of going all over, uh, the place with me. And I, you know, this is usually where I plug the socials for, for the guest and, and the band. Uh, audio event does have a Facebook page, audio event music and, uh, Instagram is audio event official. Jason has his Instagram page, uh, Jason Boyd. Um, but none of them are super active and that's fine. Uh, I actually think it means something more whenever they do post. I do hope that there will be new music uh, from the band. Uh, as you heard, it sounds like you know Ben and the, and the guys are going to get together and uh, hopefully start writing some some new songs, uh, some of the old songs, maybe reworking them, and uh, maybe Jason will just put out something solo uh, that he's been working on. But uh, very much looking forward to... Uh, seeing what comes out of those guys and Jason and in, in any capacity. Um, Cause I think they're all super talented and uh, thankful uh, that Jason reached back out to me. It was just such odd timing of it all. And was one of those that I I'm still kind of shocked that it happened uh, just under the circumstances. Uh, so without further ado, uh, wrapping up the episode, and if you would like to keep up with the podcast, it's simple enough. You can go to brewspeakpod.com. I believe this site is going to be going down here pretty soon. Uh, we have a new logo uh, that you will see soon. And so some work on the website and has to be done as well. Uh, so for the time being, just go to our socials, brewspeakpod.com on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, you can email me at brutallyspeaking at gmail.com if you have any comments, questions, uh, guest suggestions, open to all of it. Uh, definitely branching out to a lot of different people uh, lately, and I'm very excited to hopefully bring some awesome guests from different aspects of of life, really, I guess. Uh, so without further ado, for the Brutally Speaking Podcast, I am John, and I will see you all next week. Uh, I don't have anything else in the can currently, so... You'll have to come back next week and see who the guest is. So until then, have a great week.